It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here's what you're watching this morning. Well, a data-packed week kicks off today with job openings, the first of several metrics that we are going to get that gives us some insight into the labor market today and the Fed's policy path going forward. That's right. Plus, a downgrade for China. Ratings agency Moody's cutting its outlook on the country's government credit to negative. The move highlights concerns over rising debt and broader growth slowdown in the world's second largest economy economy. And gamers rejoice. The Grand Theft Auto 6 trailer is out. The latest installment of the blockbuster gaming franchise is due in 2025, more than a decade after the last game in the series. Now for our top story of the day. The stock market experienced a November to remember with the Dow and the S&P 500, both closing the month up just shy of 9%, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq gained almost 11%. With all of that in the rear view, have investors gotten too enthusiastic is the big question now. With the Fed in its blackout period, we have nothing but a deluge of data ahead to influence markets here. And this week, it's going to be squarely focused on employment. We have been talking about this at length, at least to kick off the week and ahead of some of that data coming forward. We get jolts today. We'll get ADP private payrolls Wednesday and then additionally Thursday, jobless claims. And then of course, the all important monthly reports, uh, jobs report and employment situation coming Friday here. And there you're taking a look at some of the expectations here. I kind of think back to what Matt Luzzetti from Deutsche Bank said yesterday. He's the chief U.S. economist on there. And he said that this is a really critical juncture for the labor market here going on to tell us that if it stabilizes near these current levels, then we can get a soft landing that everyone's hopeful about the market increasingly priced here. But the second derivative on these moves, he said, pretty negative here. And that's what we're going to be watching for. If you continue to get softening or weakness, then the market, as it pertains to some of the moves that we've been watching recently, starts to get concerned here a little bit about a milder recession type equation. Yeah, I think when you take a look at the equity action and what we have seen play out uh, over the last couple of days, this is only the third trading day of December. So we have to keep that in mind. And we're coming off an extremely strong month for equities. When you take a look at the fact that all three of the major averages posted their best month of, of returns so far this year. So I think a little weakness isn't anything to be too concerned about. But we also got to talk about what is priced into the market right now, because there's a lot of optimism that the Fed is going to be able to navigate this soft landing, that we could potentially see rate hikes as early as March of next year. There certainly is a lot more optimism that we will see the Fed at least a start to cut rates in the first half of the year. Of course, the exact date of that and the timing of that still remains up for debate. But if we see any material weakness in this jobs report, if we do see a big spike in unemployment, if we do see that headline number come in much lower than expectations, that's a bit of a cause for concern. We have been talking about the fact that the economy, yes, it is slowing. Nothing to be too worried about up until this point. But when you take a look at a lot of those forecasts up there, a number of strategists still anticipating some sort of recession at some point in 2024. The degree of that recession and how bad that pullback is going to be is what everyone is trying to figure out right well, now. And the Fed is going to be looking for a trend in the data here, both on the employment and on the inflationary side of the equation too here. And it seems, at least in November, for the data that we did get and then the decisions and even the minutes that came forward, there still seemed to be a lot of rate cut hopium mm -hmm. that was in the tape. And so it's the larger question to your point and just a wave of data that we're going to be getting from now through the end of the year. Where do the markets start to lean more into where that trend is taking place? And if that trend and uh, worsens to an extent where it seems like the Fed is still going to sit on its hands because we just heard from the Fed last week as well here in a lot of Fed speak that came forward. Mary Daly, cold water on the markets poured there, plus Fed Chair Jay Powell. And in all of this Fed speak, the higher for longer narrative still continued to point them to another sentence that the markets would not like, which is, hey, we're not putting a rate cut on the table as of right now. And that's exactly what we saw some reaction to on the latter end of, of last week as well. All right, Brad, let's take a look at one of the other big headlines that we're following this morning and more trouble for China. Moody is cutting its credit outlook for the world's second largest economy to negative from stable, citing worries about rising debt levels, persistently lower medium-term economic growth, as well as a downward spiral of its property sector. Now, of course, this isn't too surprising, maybe, given that China's post-COVID recovery has been rocky, to say the least, with issues like a weakened consumer and high unemployment rate among young people impacting the recovery story there. It has also had an impact 
on some U.S. companies with heavy exposure to China. And we have our very own Madison Mills here to discuss this. And guys, we're taking a look at this from specific companies that are really at risk. When you talk about the slowdown that's happening right now with China, and I know you're taking a look here at some of those consumer-facing names and specifically what's going on with some of these retailers. Yeah, I want to talk about Nike and LVMH to start things off. We know that the China story has come up a lot in their earnings calls, specifically here starting with Nike uh, in their most recent earnings, a little bit stronger of a report when it comes to the China story. With a brand like Nike, they're so big here in the United States. They've got to look to some of these emerging markets to continue to have that growth that the street is going to be looking for on their earnings. But as we've talked about many times, guys, this China story has not had the rebound of their economy that the street has been looking for and that brands like Nike have been looking for. That might be one reason that we've seen the CEO visiting several times over the past six months. Uh, and that's also why this downgrade, when you think about the earnings stories that we've been covering, it might make sense to some investors, right? Because we've seen this, this slowdown and this kind of push for more stimulus. We have seen some stimulus to these local governments uh, as Beijing does push for a little bit more of this recovery. They're looking to double their GDP by 2035, guys. Uh, and so potentially this downgrade might be a push to Beijing for more of that stimulus, which could potentially be a boon for some of these consumer names. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we're going to be looking as well at Tesla here. You've been keeping an eye on this one and what it can mean yeah. for the automotive sector. And a lot of it ties back to what Maddie was just saying, just in terms of the weak consumer right now, people thinking twice before making those purchases. And when it comes to LVMH, you can kind of guys, a lot of those purchases are pretty big purchases. Buying a car is a huge purchase. And we're starting to see the fact that the that the recovery has been much slower than maybe initially anticipated has started to weigh on Tesla's results. And we're just getting out here this week the latest, the latest data when it comes to sales in China. And this was out from the, uh, let's see here, when it comes to the sales falling just about 18% in November, the recent data from the China Passenger Car Association. So falling nearly 18% in November on a year-over-year -year basis. Why this is so significant is that we know Tesla needs China to be successful in terms right. of their sales there to really drive some of that market share, drive some of their revenue, their gains going forward. They get about 20 percent and has historically been about 15, 20 percent of the revenue relies on Asia. So the fact that they are so heavily reliant on one region of the world obviously really points to the fact that we are seeing any material weakness there. It's a little bit worrisome for Musk and for the company. We know Elon Musk recently uh, paid a lot to sit down and speak with Xi Jinping at uh, APAC not too long right. ago. So we know that he has been really driving some of the pricing war that has been playing out over in China, very focused on the region, doing everything they can to boost sales there. Yeah, I've got two names that I'm looking at with regard to this and the Moody's cut out of China here specifically. I'm going to go unsexy and then we'll go sexy <laughs> with Apple. The unsexy one, which, I mean, for a lot of construction uh, files out there, Caterpillar is still pretty sexy. But at the end of the day, you're taking a look at the pre-market move. It's down by about three tenths of a percent. Moody's actually expects the property sector to remain smaller in proportion to the entire economy than it was before the property correction that started in 2021. As a result here, this could directly impact construction here. And especially when you look at the different markers of land sales revenue that accounted ultimately for about 37 percent of their revenue, um, excluding transfers from some of the central government there in 2022. But at the end of the day, the land sales, the construction on top of those land sales as well, and what this means uh, more notably for some of that commercial property where the development is set to take place, that could directly impact a company like Caterpillar that has already seen some weakness in its construction industries in the most recent quarter. You saw a move lower by about 8% uh, in that construction industry segment here. So that's one area that I'm going to be watching. Also going to be watching closely, Apple. Anytime you hear for a call like this and, and for Moody's, what they're essentially looking at in the consumer profile within this region, they're looking at disposable income as well. Now, of course, you might be thinking, well, I need my smartphone. I sleep next to it every night, as anybody around the world probably does. But at the end of the day, the propensity to upgrade your phone becomes less likely if you're taking a look at some of those household expenditures in this region and saying, all right, well, why would a consumer want to spend up or want to get at least the higher models that are out there and introduced into the market most recently in September and now making their ways into hands and phones and perhaps your bed as well um, in these past few weeks and months here. So Apple is one that I would also be keeping a close eye on. IDC had projected that they were going to see their highest market 
market share at about 19.9 percent by the end of the year for their operating system here internationally. And so this call from Moody's certainly puts that perhaps back in focus for some investors. Yeah, it does. And I think I think it's almost across the board, right? We can sit here yeah. and list a long, long list of companies that have heavy exposure to China. We didn't get a chance to talk about Starbucks. We didn't get a chance to talk about uh, a lot of these consumer-facing names that they have focused their growth plans on this region. The fact that this recovery has been so slow, it could be a real hurdle, at least in the short term. That's bad news for the, grand, the brand of the green siren at the end of the day, perhaps. Right. Here, We're going to be watching. Maddie, thanks so much for taking the time joining us here this morning to break this all down. We're also watching shares of Take Two Interactive. It takes two. To make a thing go. You can sing the rest at home. <laughs> Lower this morning, though, after last night's release of the Grand Theft Auto 6 trailer. The highly anticipated trailer was originally supposed to go live this morning at 9 a.m., but after a leak, Rockstar released the trailer last night. The game's going to debut in 2025 with more on what to expect from the latest installment in this blockbuster franchise. Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley, Chief Games Officer here, joins us now, our CGO. Uh, Dan, I just watched the trailer before the show, and maybe I, I just don't get the franchise, dare I say. I don't want to upset any gamers out there in the entire community, but I, I don't know. I'm, pre I'm behind you the curve. You might be upsetting Hallie here. I know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm steaming and burning up right now, Brad. It. My God. <laughs> no, it's, it's Look, I totally get it, uh, but this is one of the, the biggest entertainment releases uh, two years from now. I guess a little more than a year from now, right? Uh, 2025, we, we don't know exactly when it's gonna release so far on the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. Uh, that's a big point to uh, to make just because it means that it's not gonna launch on PC at first. So why is this such a, an important game? Well, let's just go over some of the numbers for the Grand Theft Auto franchise. This is from Take-Two's last earnings report. They say, Franchise-wide, they've sold 410 million units. So 410 million individual copies of games. Uh, for Grand Theft Auto V, which came out, by the way, it'll be 12 years since the launch of Grand Theft Auto V uh, when we get Grand Theft Auto VI uh, in uh, 2025. That's three console generations that it's been across the PlayStation 3, 4, 5, same thing with the Xbox. Uh, Grand Theft Auto V, 190 million units sold. Continues to sell today. They have uh, that spawned Grand Theft Auto Online, which is now a persistent online world where you can jump on and play with people uh, wherever you want. Uh, that generates continuing revenue for Take Two. Uh, I was speaking to some uh, analysts and experts in gaming about what this kind of means. And, you know, for the industry, it's going to be an absolutely massive bellwether. Uh, you know, is this the, the game that helps uh, to continue to drive the idea of what, what gaming can be? Look, Grand Theft Auto uh, 3 was probably the breakout hit. It was the first game to be like an open world style game where you can literally just go out and do whatever you want. Uh, four just expanded on that. Uh, five, even more so. And now six, where you're in what is basically uh, Vice City, essentially Miami, uh, Florida. Uh, you can see a lot of the game is making fun of the, the world around you. Uh, I don't know if you could tell from all the TikToks and uh, ridiculous behavior, but, you know, it's 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 a game that pokes fun at that. Uh, but look, it's it's expected to to sell millions and millions of copies uh, right out of the gate. I think the, the, the biggest thing here is the expectations. What, you know, whether or not it'll be a smash hit that, that Grand Theft Auto V is uh, or was that can sell so well for 12 years in in gaming that's that's bonkers right that doesn't make any sense for for video games usually it's you know a game does very well uh for a few months a year uh and then people will go back maybe get them uh on sale you know see some boosts here and there recently uh uh take two had said that uh, or reports came out that the most people were playing its other franchise, Rockstar Games, other franchise, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, uh, since it launched, uh, which is wild considering how long that's been out. But this is going to be just a, a, a ridiculous launch. I'm very excited, obviously. I can't wait to get my hands on it. But at the same time, as I said, it's been 12 years. Gaming's changed a lot. We didn't have Fortnite uh, when Grand Theft Auto V came out. We didn't have uh, games along those lines, uh, Roblox, where you know more people are jumping in. They want to be able to create in their games. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see you know, if the, the formula holds up. I, I think it's going to, um, just from the hype for the, the, the trailer itself. Uh, you know, gamers get very excited uh, about any little tidbits. This is one that's been around for, uh, we've been waiting for for a while. And so the trailer gets, gets a lot of play. 
we'll see though when when it actually launches what what the the full reception will be we will see there's been a lot of hype there's been endless rumors even leaks over the last a decade or so just so much anticipation for this game so i'm sure it's going to be a hit one way or another even though brad's not too excited for it i mean look i had did dan know, convince you yeah, I mean, he convinced me, yeah, the success of the game, the numbers work out, the economics, unit economics, they're great on it, Dan, we know that. I even got flashbacks of that Alligator Man episode of Atlanta <laughs> when I saw that huge reptile of a being making its way into what looked like a local bodega. So, I mean, it's going to be a fun game, no doubt. We'll see. Um, but we'll see if the sales are, because you mentioned the consoles that this has been so popular on. Yeah. Um, decades here now that we've seen this be a success. Yeah, I don't know, maybe yeah, it'll turn us into wild. gamers. Maybe, I don't know. maybe. All right, Hallie, we got to leave it there. Dan Hallie, thanks so much. We have to turn to another mover here this morning. AT&T has made a big choice here, a big decision, and it wasn't Nokia. Now the telecom giant partnering with Ericsson in a $14 billion five-year contract to launch a new revamped telecom network here in the U.S. That's sending shares of Nokia to the lowest level that we've seen in years. We're looking at shares of Ericsson really moving to the upside here in trading up just about 3%. When it comes to why this is so substantial, obviously this is could be viewed as a big blow here to Nokia just in terms of the fact that they lost this contract, what this is going to do in terms of delaying some of those profit targets, but also what is included in this deal with Ericsson. And one of the things that stuck out to me in this report was the fact that Ericsson saying in a statement said that this is almost a game changer here for the industry or a strategic industry shift, to put it in their words. And they're talking about the fact that AT&T is going to be able to choose vendors when it comes to some of their suppliers. So when it comes to antennas, when it comes to infrastructure going forward, they're going to be able to choose their vendors, have a choice rather than being locked into one single relationship, which I think really differentiates what we see in this deal compared to the prior deals and also what we have seen really across the board within the industry. Yeah, a lot of people getting a crash course today on radio access networks. Uh, of course, a sexy thing to begin uh, your day with and have your morning coffee with, but it's essentially a kind of component of wireless techno uh, techno telecommunications, excuse me, system connecting devices to other radio frequencies and whatnot. But at the end of the day, this is huge news uh, and a loss, a blow to Nokia, but huge for Ericsson on the other side of this. AT&T and, and what they're saying here, they're going to continue to run that ORAN, which is the radio access network that I was breaking down a moment ago, that deployment as one of the largest investors in the U.S. here. That's been a massive investment that they've been talking about over the course of this year with regard to the digital infrastructure um, that they're trying to kind of fast track here for that next wave of connectivity here. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're saying that they also noted um, this new collaboration with Ericsson to enhance its wireless network in North America, expanding 5G. Um, the expected spend under the new contract is below what the company expects to spend for wireless capital expenditure over the next five years. So that's something that investors may be kind of looking and thumbing through previous earnings reports just to get a good figure on, on what they were talking about beforehand. And now this perhaps uh, just a little bit lower than what the company had earmarked even prior to that. Uh, so we'll continue to keep a close look at AT&T shares this morning, too. We've also got to talk a little BlackRock on the morning, receiving $100,000 as seed capital for its proposed Bitcoin ETF. That was disclosed in an application to the SEC this week. The investor bought 4000 at $25 a share in October of this year. This comes about a month before analysts anticipate either one or more spot ETFs will get approval from regulators. For more on this, let's bring in Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blicker. He's here at the desk. Hey, Brad. Oh, don't let me get too comfortable. This is nice. Yes. Um, and I do have the Wi-Fi Interactive here right in front of me, of course. But I'm looking at the <laughs> list of companies. You mentioned BlackRock. You look at the list of companies on the Wi-Fi Interactive that currently have uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs just waiting for approval. Here's Black. BlackRock, here's Grayscale, a mm. word on them in a second, Fidelity, Van Eck, Franklin Templeton, Bitwise, all of these guys jockeying to be the first, but it's probably going to be all of them at once, except maybe Grayscale. Now, Grayscale is the entity that manages the GBTC, that's the Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust, one of the few in the world, only available to private subscribers. It's a closed-end fund. They've wanted to convert it to an ETF so they can get retail investors, and they were the ones who followed the lawsuit, and they won with respect to the SEC. They beat the SEC, but it's not clear yet if they're going to be among these first movers. But as far as the date, we're looking at January 10th to January, uh, January 5th to January 10th. There are two different uh, 
offices within the SEC that have to clear this. Uh, two different con congressional laws at work. You have the 1934 Securities and Exchange Act, and you also have the 1933 Securities Act. And uh, paperwork was, was just filed by BlackRock, and that information you were talking about, the seed investor, who's investing in this ETF that hasn't been launched yet? Well, a seed investor. This is how you start the process. And so we kind of knew that already. It already leaked out, but this is confirmation. And just another incremental step, more incremental knowledge that this is going to happen and happen soon, early January. Jared, how much of this do you think is already baked in just in terms of the oh, excitement? Oh. And I say that with the price of Bitcoin because it has been astonishing to see the rise in the price of Bitcoin going back to the start of the year. Even within the last month, it's up another 20%. If we do see this approval, how big of a catalyst do you think? Well, you know, the, the old adage on Wall Street is buy the rumor, sell the news. I hope not because <laughs> I'm looking at the Wi-Fi interactive. Bitcoin is the crypto in general. It's the number one asset class of the year. I mean, forget the Magnificent Seven. Bitcoin up 152%. Let's take a look at this chart. In anticipation of all of this, arguably, this got started down here. I mean, we've been hearing about this for months, and but the anticipation really led to this latest launch up. We had uh, Bitcoin stuck at about 30,000. So I think a lot of this news is already baked in, but I think the momentum is there to keep Bitcoin alive. I think the winter is done. I don't think we're ever going to see 20,000 again. Mm -hmm. You can quote me on that. And I think it's off to the races. You know, it's interesting because we also got some commentary from Robin CEO, Vlad Tenev, yes. on the state of Bitcoin as well. Yeah, um, let's take a listen because Brian Sazi was able to interview him yesterday and uh, let's take a listen. I think crypto activity, you're, you're seeing kind of a, a groundswell. Um, what tends to happen is um, uh, we've seen in the past as the price of Bitcoin uh, approaches all time highs, the media coverage and intensity uh, increases. And I think that plays a role as well, if people are just hearing more about crypto around them, uh, they tend to become more interested and, and you start to see that reflected in trading activity, at least in the past. Yeah, I think uh, we, we're not anywhere near all-time highs, so we don't have to worry about the sell the news event, top ticking Bitcoin. Uh, we've already been through that, and arguably the Coinbase IPO years ago top ticked uh, the current uh, all-time high in Bitcoin. Nevertheless, um, it looks like there's still a lot of excitement. Is it going to be a sell the news? Are we going to see a little bit of a pullback or maybe just a pullback in time? We'll have to see. And then the Bitcoin halving expected in 2024 as well. Yes, That's I the next major catalyst. Yeah, the April-May time period that has always historically, and it only happens, what, every couple of years. Yeah. Um, the last one, we saw a huge run-up in price. That was... Mm -hmm also funded by the stimulus payments. I mean, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. You have to consider what's happening in the economy, what's happening in people's trading's account, trading accounts. But I think uh, a lot of the damage from the bear market that we had last year is kind of in the rearview mirror. Investors are still shell-shocked a little bit. Um, it was very painful in the bond market. But crypto people, uh, crypto, I, I, I would close by saying this. They, the laser eyes, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, the laser eyes, <laughs> you know, the thoughts of Bitcoin 1 million and all these uh, Kathy Wood dreams. Um, I, hey, I think, I think we're going to see half a million someday, um, but it's going to take a while to get there. And this is just the beginning of this asset class really becoming. I think this, is, this next crypto bull run is the one that establishes it within Wall Street. That's when we see the major brokerages like Fidelity start getting into their accounts. So this is when crypto becomes big time right now. And yeah, there always seems to be, they're diehard fans, and there always seems to be this optimism for yes. higher highs. So we will see. All right, Jared, thanks. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back. AI has been the dominant theme in the market this year with Nvidia leading the charge. The stock is more than tripled. AI enthusiasm has also contributed to tech leading market gains overall. But now it's raising questions about whether it's gotten too expensive. Nvidia, for example, has a forward price to earnings ratio of 38 versus about 30 for the broader tech universe and 20 for the S&P 500. Does it belong in your portfolio? And if not, how do you play AI? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
Is your glass looking half full after the so-called November to remember? Might be time to reassess that optimism, according to Russell Investments. The team there warning against over-optimism in 2024, saying they believe recession might be avoided next year, but investment risks remain elevated. Joining us for the discussion, we've got our very own Madison Mills. Maddie, you've been digging into this one a little bit this morning. I have, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the Fed calls first, and then we can go into the recession sure. calls from this outlook for 2024 from Truist to start things off. Uh, they specifically talk about the Fed cut coming in the middle of the year in June, as opposed to March, and that's what the street is overwhelmingly pricing in at this point, or I should just say the majority, not overwhelmingly. Uh, so they're looking at a cut coming in June, but they talk about the long and variable lags of the Federal Reserve weighing on the overall economy. So they say that there's a chance that we could see a slowdown that puts us into recessionary territory, uh, but that we also could see some growth when it comes to the economy. They say that they're about equal on both of those calls here. They also say that they see the S&P returning between 5 and 10 percent in the market heading into this year. And guys, interestingly, I feel like in these 2024 calls, I haven't seen a ton of data on election years. So mm. I was curious about that. They have a whole section on that here. Uh, they talk about the election years coinciding historically with choppy stock markets, but that they, they do uh, lead to more returns in the end, that 89 percent of the time in an election year, you end on an upward note. That being said, things can get a little bit choppy throughout the year as, you know, elections are volatile. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things when it comes to the election calls, exactly what that is going to do, how much uncertainty that then adds, and then volatility, of course, as we lead up to that. The other, the other thing that stuck out to me about this note was the return to 60-40, and we talk about mm -hmm bonds and their placement in an investor's portfolio looking ahead. You talk about the fact that there is this risk of recession. What are we seeing there? And is that something that you've noticed? Because I know you've been digging through a number of these calls over the last several weeks that maybe there is starting to be more support for that return to 6040. Yeah, especially given the past couple of months, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see how those calls continue given uh, I think it was the strongest 6040 portfolio month since the early 90s uh, in November. So get, getting a lot of strength when it comes to that portfolio mix. And this note in particular, they do say that they want to stick to high investment grade bonds. Uh, and that does sort of mirror what I've seen in other notes. I think about Hartnett's note saying, that uh, they're interested in a little bit of a mixed portfolio when it comes to bonds, looking at things like 30-year treasuries blended with investment-grade tech, uh, getting that sort of mix there. He said that that's a way for you to own the balance sheet of tech companies without having to own the stock as a potential hedge against that hard landing. Uh, but Shauna, to your question on the 60-40 makeup here, uh, they say in this note, uh, this is our anticipation right now of what 2024 is going to look like, but all of that could change. So also adding some hedging for them about what that portfolio mix could look like heading into the end of 24. Yeah, there certainly is a lot of hedging when it comes to a lot of these outlooks, and rightfully so, given the fact that it's very unpredictable what those uh, future moves are going to look like. All right, Maddie, thanks. We want to get over to the opening bell. It's ringing right now. Jared Blickery standing by with some of the uh, early action that we're seeing here at the Open, Jared. Got to tell you, Shauna, December has been a little bit of a disappointment so far. Uh, we're taking a look at the Dow here. Let's take a look over the last three trading days. Uh, just starting the day here, we can see still in positive territory, up 43 basis points over that time. NASDAQ is down 43 for the day. That's basis points and down about 7 tenths of 1% for the month. So nothing big yet. But we have been seeing a rotation for sure. The Magnificent Seven, they, did their, they carried the water for the rest of the market all year long. They're taking a little bit of a backseat. Tech is one of, or has been one of the, the sectors in the red today. Also taking a look at materials and consumer discretionary. We got Amazon in there. But staples and utilities, those two defensive sectors are the only ones in the green. Um, over the last three days, real estate, interestingly, is number one. Industrials, utilities, staples, consumer discretionary. Healthcare, financials, and energy, all of those outperforming and slightly in the green for only a couple. But let's take a look at the NASDAQ. As I said, it's been a different story for the mega caps. I'm going to switch it back today and let's just see what we got going on. Apple, nice little pop there. Tesla up 15 basis points, but not a lot of dark green or dark red. I'm going to take a look at some of our leaders here. It looks like meme stocks and Bitcoin. Just had a big discussion about that. Those are up three and one and a half percent, respectively. A couple other names in there. Let's just take a look at some of the crypto stocks that are jumping today. We got 
Some of these up 19%. Um, I don't know all of these, but I do know a couple. Here's Marathon, and let's take a look at the year to date. Very highly levered to the Bitcoin uh, price, and we can see it's up 342.7%, still well off of these highs here. But a lot of these crypto stocks, let me just show you what they've done over the last month with Bitcoin. A lot of big numbers here, guys. Certainly are a lot of big numbers there. All right, Jerry, we're going to check in with you in just a bit. We want to talk a little bit more about the outlook as we look ahead to 2024. November certainly signaled something of changing of the tide for the investment community, the higher for longer debate morphing into a back and forth over when the Fed will finally start cutting its benchmark rate. JP Morgan Private Bank has launched its 2024 global investment outlook after the rate reset. Now, it identified five key themes for investors to consider as we approach the new year. They include inflation settling, bonds being more competitive with stocks, and AI as the game changer. Let's dig into all of it. We have Abby Yoder here joining us on set. JP Morgan, private bank, U.S. equity strategist. And Abby, it's great to see you here again. So lots to dig into. And let's first start with that first point that was outlined there in the intro. Inflation is going to likely settle. How should investors be thinking about that in terms of what that means for investment opportunity? Well, the important component of it when we're thinking about inflation is kind of like this immaculate disinflation that's happened, right? So typically, historically, what we've seen is when inflation is coming down, it's at the expense of the labor market. Mm -hmm. And while we've seen some softening in the labor market, overall, inflation has been coming down on its own, right? It hasn't been at the expense of really jo the job market, for that matter. You've seen wages cool. Mm -hmm. um, but importantly, what that means, okay, what does that mean about the backdrop? That means the actual demand and economic growth backdrop has been very strong, and we expect that to slow into the into 2024, but to continue to remain resilient. Again, driven by that strength in the employment picture, but with inflation coming down, which gives the Fed more leeway as it relates to cutting rates. So a lot of people then would say, right now, yields look really tempting. Mm -hmm. And so what is kind of the, the setup now going into 2024? Is it already as, as good as it gets, and now you have to kind of reconfigure a little bit? Well, I think right now is a great opportunity in terms of fixed income. And what what the setup ha like looks like for us right now, we're optimistic on equities, we're optimistic on bonds. What that means for clients is you have more options. Mm -hmm. There are different ways that you can construct portfolios and still get to that long-term return that you're looking for, because this is the first time in a very long time, let's call it 15, 20 years, where bonds actually really do look attractive. And so there's just more portfolio construction options, I think, today than there were over the past 15 years. I mean, AI being a game changer was mm -hmm. one of the uh, topic points or one of the investment themes for you guys this year. Should we be thinking about it? Should investors be thinking about that in the lens of the Magnificent Seven? Or mm -hmm. where could we else, I guess, see leadership from maybe some of those lesser known names? No, I actually think there's going to be a broadening out. Yes, we think the MAG7 are going to do very well next year, and that's driven by, by both cyclical and structural factors. Cyclical being, you know, um, enterprise spend by different corporates, and then AI being the more structural part that we're going to see a lot more companies start to monetize next year. And that's, again, broadens out outside the MAG7. So we're focused on actually smaller to mid-cap companies that we think are a little bit less known in that arena that we think will do well in 2024 as they, again, start to monetize this trend as well. I mean, many of us expected for there to be an AI rug pull for some of the names that didn't have an immediate pass-through yes. or it just didn't make sense how this was actually going to contribute to their bottom line here. So is in the Magnificent Seven play, is, is there, in that broadening, broadening out that you were talking about, is that kind of inclusive of some of the Coca-Colas of the world, the, the Wendy's of the world that have even said, oh, yeah, generative AI is massive for us. Mm -hmm. um, but for the rest of us, just saying, okay, well, you know, a lot of people have included that in their talking points. Where is that really going to have perhaps further proliferation throughout the markets? Well, so I think there's within tech specifically, right? Right now, it's really semiconductors that are benefiting from right. the, the monetization. Down the line, we think it's going to be software that then starts to see that. And then when we're thinking about, okay, what do we hear from companies when we're talking to them or listening to them on earnings calls and they're talking about this? And to your point, it's like in food service and it's in different, in different industries. I think, I mean... I think that there, th this is going to be a cross-industry phenomenon. There's plenty of ways for all of these different co companies to utilize this transformational technology that's going to create efficiencies and um, and productivity that I think will benefit the, the economy just at large. All right. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait for more generative AI. <laughs> Why not? Abby Yoder, JP Morgan, private bank, U.S. equity strategist. Thanks so much for taking the time here with us. Thank you.
Well, Raymond James downgrading Lululemon to outperform. That is down from a strong buy here. But the analyst hiking the price target to $495 per share. The investment bank saying soft U.S. consumer demand will make it difficult for the company to deliver below out fourth quarter results. Also saying competitor promos in the athletic category were similar or up compared to last year. And that's a sign of duress from the industry. This comes just a day after Wells Fargo also downgraded the company to equal weight from overweight, but leaving the price target unchanged. Here. I've seen a wave of promotions across athleisure, yeah. especially amid the holiday season, and, and it's been remarkable. And now it's showing up in this most recent call from Raymond James as well. Yeah, it has. Allo, one of their biggest competitors, essentially ran a 30% off sale for the better part of November. Lululemon, I did some shopping there over the Black Friday oh, yeah? weekend. Yeah, getting ready for the holidays. It's not about the, the belt bags this year. It's not about the belt bags, although they were also on sale. But there was a heck of a lot of their merchandise and a lot of their products that were included in their sale offerings more, I thought, than maybe, or at least the same, a pretty level uh, playing field than what we saw last year. So just as on the consumer side, anecdotally, I have noticed this. In terms of what this means, I think, going into 2024, we talk about the fact that consumers are pulling back on their spending. They're thinking twice about their budgets. They're not necessarily going out spending 120 bucks on yoga pants when they could get it cheaper elsewhere. Right. So a lot of these companies that ha did have that pricing power up until this point are being forced to adjust Lululemon potentially being one of them. And that's the reason why we've seen a number of analysts get a little bit more bearish or a little bit more cautious, maybe is a safer thing to say, when it comes to this name and what those future gains could look like here in the short term. Well, that's a question about what does a trade down look like in athleisure right now? We've, we've spoken to all of seemingly the running CEOs or at least executives from some of the major running companies, Brooks Running, New Balance, Nike. We had the opportunity to speak to their chief impact officer and discussed running with them as well. And all of these things considered, sure, the shoe and the innovation that people are looking across, that's one facet of this. But then if you think about the rest of the attire that you're purchasing, what's that trade down look like? Does it mean that people are going from purchasing Lululemon to purchasing maybe Gap's Athleta? Or does that mean that you're purchasing, I was just looking at some sales on athletics, for goodness sakes. Like, there are just a range of options that are out there for consumers, especially in this time of year. And for a lot of those companies that are playing in this space, many of them uh, who are publicly traded, thinking about what that next leg of innovation looks like beyond just how far does it stretch, what the moisture wicking looks like and all the different categories that they're trying to play in as the corporate workplace becomes a little bit more casual. You see me come in every day. I'm wearing a hat I wear and leggings a hoodie. A lot when I'm exactly. <laughs> so we're, we're stepping in here in athleisure and casual wear every morning here. And at the end of the day, I think that trade down could benefit some other companies that we typically wouldn't think of as leaders in this category, but certainly do have market share just because of the fact that they've got scale. And Gap could be, could be one of those. There's no major calls out on that right now. That's just one I'm thinking through. And too. American Eagle, too, right? American Their Eagle. Very brand has been yes. very popular, especially amongst Gen Z and millennials. So you talk about the fact that when you take a look at their leggings, which typically range between 45, 60 bucks, many of them also on sale right now. If you're looking to save a buck, that could be a good option, too. So certainly there is this trade down going on, and that's been consistent almost across the board. Yeah, that's spot on. Uh, we're also watching shares of Wells Fargo mm -hmm. this morning, too. Wells Fargo CEO Charlie Shore saying and warning over large severance expenses in the fourth quarter. He says that the bank is looking at, quote, something like $750 million to a little less than a billion dollars of severance in the fourth quarter that we weren't anticipating just because we want to continue to focus on efficiency here. So this is a, a very kind of couched and uh, almost mystical way of saying that there's more layoffs coming at Wells Fargo, it seems like. Yeah, they need to be a little bit more efficient. They need to be a little bit more disciplined. That is a theme that we've been hearing from a number of our strategists throughout this earnings season. And it looks like it is reflected here in some of the comments that we're getting from Wells Fargo's CEO. Charlie Scharf also went on to say that the company is going to have to be more aggressive about their own internal actions. But again, he said that we do think that 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 is the right thing to do for the long term. Again, he's making these comments at the Goldman Sachs U.S. Financial Services a conference here today. So a bit of a move here on the stock in early trading off just about 1%. Let's take a look at CVS announcing today it's transforming the way it reimburses pharmacies for prescription medications. In a new program, pharmacy benefit managers are going to reimburse CVS's retail pharmacies based on the amount that CVS paid for the drugs. Now, this comes amid some scrutiny on drug prices with the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, investigating the company's practices 
earlier this year. And this is an issue that has really garnered bipartisan support, one of the few issues uh, that Republicans and Democrats have agreed on here in the last uh, several years when it comes to drug pricing, dr uh, drug price gouging, as uh, some lawmakers have uh, uh, described it in the past. But this move here towards this cost plus approach was introduced by billionaire uh, Mark Cuban mm -hmm. at his pharmacy. We talked about that a little bit. It all comes down to transparency and accountability and CVS at least making the case that this new plan going forward, the fact that they are trying to simplify drug pricing, it is a step in that direction in making some of these prices more transparent to consumers. Yeah, they plan to launch uh, CVS Caremark True Cost in 2025. Uh, they said through this approach, some of the clients are going to have that flexibility, choosing a pharmacy benefit model that then works for them, best for the unique needs of the members in the plan, uh, and then that the true cost, provi or true cost provides another valuable option for them as well here. So uh, they're also launching in tandem with this Health Spire uh, for their health services segment as well. So it seems like a few of the rollouts beginning to kind of roll out publicly this month, advancing through 2024, you're seeing share price move higher in reaction to this news on the day by about 2.9 percent right now. All right. Well, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. COP28 is well underway in Dubai as global leaders meet to discuss the ongoing climate crisis. Now, the Paris Climate Agreement did set the stage for net zero carbon emissions by 2050, giving companies a deadline of how quickly and efficiently these emissions need to fall. But our next guest does say that in addition to providing some clarity, the time limit has contributed to a, quote, dangerous complacency. We want to bring in Henry Fernandez, MSCI chairman and CEO, joining us now. It's great to see you here, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us from COP28. Let's talk about that quote that I just read there, a period of dangerous complacency. I guess how put in perspective for our viewers and for us some of the challenges that you see it presenting in terms of that timeline. So the Paris Agreement that was reached uh, in you know, 2015 is uh, going to be remembered as one of those landmark agreements in the history of humankind. So, uh, you know, we all celebrated for sure. Uh, part of that, though, was that the date that they put for uh, decarbonization was an outside date in order to get 200 countries to agree. And that's always in 2050. 
this problem is happening right now. You know, there is existential threat to the world, uh, to portfolios, to companies, to households, uh, to people living in, in, all, in all areas of the world. So he has led to some complacency that they don't have to deal with the problem until the 2030s and the 2050s or the 2040s. This is already happening. Henry, it, you know, it's amazing because we're coming off of and, and probably about to close the books on what might be the hottest year on record that we've seen. And so there's been even more focus around what the real impacts in volatility and climate mean and, and the steps that we need to rapidly take. You know, thinking through COP26 and what we're or COP28, excuse me, and what world leaders are saying going into and even during some of these meetings, does it sound like they are sounding the five alarm fire to say we need to do something right now? For sure, uh, we all need to blow the horn that, uh, you know, this is a clear and present danger uh, to all of us and the world. Uh, a lot of progress is, is being made, uh, but there's still a long, long way to go. So, uh, so I think world leaders are trying to do that. They're trying to alert their citizens, their population, that uh, it's something to be taken seriously. That it doesn't mean that it is uh, all of it is happening right now, or that it will happen in the next few years. But that we need to get on this process of decarbonizing and de-risking and finding alternative uh, sources of energy, so that we can have uh, you know the the hundred trillion dollar economy thriving and sort of and and uh, creating prosperity and economic growth for uh, citizens of the world. When it comes to some of the uh, priorities or, I guess, opportunities and the risks in terms of how companies are assessing climate risk, you talk about the fact that there's an essential here need for the finance and investment in terms of finding some of those large scale solutions. I guess, how are companies assessing this in your perspective? So the first thing is that, uh, like any market, when there are investors and users of capital, that all of that depends on information, depends on data, depends on analysis, views, judgments, opinions, research. And we're at a stage in which that's what we're building right now. We're building the information so people can assess the opportunities and the threats in their portfolios uh, of, uh, with all those companies, or, you know, whether it's equity or bonds or alternative investments. So a lot of what is being worked on right now in these COPs is the infrastructure to provide that. It's about the disclosures, it's about the data, it's about the regulations, uh, it's about the analysis. And then, then over time, then people are gonna start looking at all of that and determine what is a, a good value, what is a bad value, what is a, a good risk, what is a bad risk, and then determine prices and determine trading. You know, what do you buy, what you sell, what you keep. So right now, a lot of the focus is building that foundation. It's a means to an end, right? It's the foundation to being able to then assess risk and return in securities and in investments. Henry Fernandez, MSCI Chairman and CEO. Thanks so much for taking the time to help us break this down. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Certainly. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's gonna take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan. But I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. For months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024.
Gold prices hit a record high this week, but are we treading water this morning here? This comes as investors await more economic data that could influence the Fed's rate decision later this month. For more on all of this, we've got Yahoo Finance reporter Ines Ferre here with us. Hey, Ines. Yeah, Brad, and this Friday, that jobs report is really going to be important because it will determine if we see or are seeing the labor market that's continuing to cool if the Fed's job is done. And part of the reason why we have seen gold prices surging lately is because of the market expectation that the Fed is done tightening and perhaps there could be even rate cuts next year. And so that's why you're seeing the markets that with, when it comes to gold going higher, I'm going to put up a 10 day chart here so that you can see uh, right up here. Remember, there's gold futures and there's spot prices. And we just saw the spot prices yesterday that reached an all-time high. We saw gold futures also that reached uh, new highs as well, above $2,100 uh, per ounce. But then we have seen it come back down a bit. So there is resistance around the 2000 level. And this is, or excuse me, this is a floor uh, among uh, the 2000 level. It was resistance. And now we are seeing that uh, gold is at $2,034 uh, uh, per ounce. Now, we are seeing this move go higher with gold because also we have seen the 10-year Treasury, which I'm going to pull up here, that has gone lower. So there is this relationship where if the 10-year Treasury is going lower, then investors, then bonds aren't as attractive to investors, so therefore they go into gold. And that is the correlation that we've been seeing. We we also have been watching the U.S. dollar index, so we're watching gold dip a little bit today. The U.S. dollar index is going higher. Uh, gold is denominated in U.S. dollars, so there is that inverse correlation between the dollar index and gold. Now, we have spoken to analysts. Two schools of thought here that some analysts are saying, watch out, don't chase this rally when it comes to gold. And others are saying that you are seeing the beginning of a bull market for gold, that gold is going to go much higher. We've even seen calls of $3,000 per ounce in the next uh, 12 months. And that's just simply because gold hasn't done much for a while, uh, even though we have seen highs back in 2020, we saw highs, and now we're seeing highs now. But, you know, the saying goes is uh, the bigger the base, the higher in space. And certainly there are bulls out there that are calling for gold to go higher, guys. We certainly are after this run to the upside. All right, Ines, thanks. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break, but on the other side, much more of today's market moving action. We'll be right back. AI has been the dominant theme in the market this year, with NVIDIA leading the charge. The stock is more than tripled. AI enthusiasm has also contributed to tech leading market gains overall. But now it's raising questions about whether it's gotten too expensive. NVIDIA, for example, has a forward price to earnings ratio of 38 versus about 30 for the broader tech universe and 20 for the S&P 500. Does it belong in your portfolio? And if not, how do you play AI? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day and stocks are continuing to pull back just a bit following a down day on Monday to start the week. Investors are taking in some of the key services and labor market data being released right now. We're looking at the S&P essentially unchanged. Taking a look at some individual names, a mixed picture for NEO, the Chinese EV maker, reported a narrower than expected loss thanks to a record 55,000 deliveries in its third quarter. Still, NEO behind its sales goal of shipping 250,000 EVs this year. It only reached a little over 142,000 by the end of November. And GitLab blowing past expectations here in the third quarter, reporting a 32% surge in revenue on a year-over-year -year basis, as well as its f first adjusted operating profit. Looking ahead, GitLab also impressing investors with its full-year outlook as a CEO, saying that the company is in talks with Amazon Web Services about an integration into the Amazon Q work assistant. And I'll actually be speaking with the CEO out of the Barclays Tech Conference later this week. So we'll hear more about that. Can't wait for that. All right. Well, finally, we're all also watching Barclays on news that Qatar is holding its... Uh, is holding, slashing its stake in the bank, selling over $640 million worth of shares this week. It's Barclays' second biggest shareholders, and the sale is expected to reduce its stake from 5.3% to 2.9%. Just last week, the Financial Times reported that Barclays is exploring an overhaul plan to drop thousands of clients, cut over $1 billion worth of costs, and boost profits. All right, we've got some breaking news right now on job turnover, job openings and labor turnover. The JOLTS number, now the number of job openings falling to 8.7 million as of, as of the end of October and digging in to what we're seeing on a sector basis. Now, oh, during the month, job openings decreasing in healthcare and social assistance. That was a drop by about 236,000. Finance and insurance, a drop there of 168,000. Real estate and rental and leasing, a drop there of 49,000. On the flip side, we did see job openings increase in the information sector. That was up nearly 40,000, an increase of 39,000. So again, the job openings number coming down just a bit, falling to 8.7 million. We're getting this number ahead of the big employment number on Friday when everyone's trying to figure out how much cooling we could potentially see within the labor market. Yeah, and when we think about the hires part of this particular report too, hires were a little changed at 5.9 million and 3.7 percent respectively. The number of hires decreased though in accommodation and food services. That was down 100 10,000 here. Now, what's particular to note here as well, on the other side of hires, you got the separations. And this can really give you more of a sense of how the labor force is thinking about the opportunity to leave one job and get another. Notably, quits are generally kind of voluntary separations initiated by the employee, and this rate can serve as a measure of, of workers' willingness or ability to leave jobs here. Total separations in October, little changed at 5.6 million. The rate was unchanged at 3.6%. That was the fifth consecutive month that we saw that as well here. So uh, a lot to really break down within this report. It doesn't seem like the market's moving too, too much on this, but actually we're seeing now the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ uh, creep into positive territory. NASDAQ up by about four tenths of a percent, S&P 500 flat, just barely to the, uh, the upside, while the Dow is still in negative territory. Yes, yeah, so I'm slowing there in the jobs market, at least from this number, certainly much lower than what the street was anticipating, the 8.7 million number. Of course, how this pretends or what this uh, tells us about the cooling that we could see going forward. This is something that the Fed has warned about. Chair Jay Powell has talked about time and time again. When they, when we do have rates at such a high level, we were expecting, obviously, some pressure on the labor market. It's taken a bit longer than initially forecasted, but at least from this number, we're seeing a bit of cooling with the number of job openings coming back just a bit. Just briefly, also, we did want to mention that we had also gotten a reading uh, that came out from the S&P PMI reading, uh, and broad, broad strokes here, they noted that healthcare remains the best-performing U.S. sector in November. Some of the other key findings, basic materials production rose at the fastest pace that we had seen since May of 2022. But consumer services activities, uh, they declined again in November here. Uh, particularly, they had noted financials and consumer goods seeing the steepest reductions in business activity during November, latter experiencing the fastest drop in production volumes since June here. So just a little bit more of that economic data that we've seen come out over the course of this morning here.
As we look ahead to 2024, our next guest says that investors should not keep their strategy on autopilot and tend to be prepared to make portfolio adjustments. With much debate around Fed policy going into the new year, investors will still have to keep their eyes on economic data to determine moves in the market. The data-dependent Fed is going to be looking at information like today's jolts report, which showed the labor market slowing, job openings falling to just 8.7 million in October. Joining us now, we've got Keith Lerner, Truist Co-Chief Investment Officer. Officer. Keith, always a pleasure to grab some of your insights. Thanks for kicking off the trading session here with us about 35 minutes into today's activity. As you think about that portfolio repositioning that some would be apt to consider going into 2024, what most notably comes to mind for you? Yeah, well, first, great to be with you, Brad, and Sean, always a real pleasure. So, you know, the calendar shifts. Our strategy doesn't shift because of the calendar. We're really going into 2024, the position the way we are. And what that means is, you know, we're basically more in line with our long-term targets across stocks, bonds, and cash. We've had big overweights in the U.S., big overweights in, in, in large caps uh, relative to small caps. Um, and, you know, what I think it is, is one of our key models is to be prepared that as we progress in the year, that our strategy by the end of next year will probably look a lot different than coming in. Because there's a lot of key questions that obviously we're all focused on. You just mentioned one of them. Um, the Federal Reserve you know, policy, as an example, um, you know, historically, after the Fed um, does its first rate cut, which the market's on the price in March, which we actually think is a little bit premature. But either way, when you look 12 months forward, the market moves up uh, more than 10 percent or less than 10 percent, depending on if you go into a recession. So that, along with the election, there's going to be a lot of tactical opportunities. But again, you also have to be patient for more of the evidence to shift more decidedly one way. Keith, when it comes to the fact that you're saying that investors need to just be prepared, they cannot be on autopilot when it comes to some of their strategies, some of their investments. How would you compare maybe your anticipation for 2024 to what investors had to do this year and then pre-pandemic levels? I mean, when it comes to that hands-on type of approach that you're advocating for. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, for some folks that have like, you know, a 10-year horizon, one year is not going to make that much of a difference. But what, what I'm basically saying is I think you know, when you look at history uh, in any year, by the way, but especially one where the Fed's shifted, is that you're more likely going to have a more dram dramatic move than, you know, 5% in either direction. So I would just say this year, relative to like the early part of a cycle where you basically just want to be part of the market, I think it's being more important to shift within the market. So that means right now we're overweight large caps, we're still overweight technology and communications. At some point during the year, I think it will make sense to, to dig harder into small caps. Now, they've done better more recently. But other areas of the market, and there's also a probability if we start seeing some of that job data, which still is firm, starting to weaken, you know, maybe we could become more defensive. But again, instead of pushing our narrative on what the market should do, we'll let the data speak for itself. In some ways, we're data dependent. It's like the Fed. <laughs> when you talk about the Fed, that maybe investors should be ready to shift to some of those underperforming parts of the market. I know a lot of it just depends on the data that's coming out. But more specifically, I guess, what are you looking for in terms of maybe the fact or some of the signals that you would be getting that would then signal to you that you need to shift your strategy? Sure. So a couple of things we look at in our strategy. Um, you know, the first thing we start off with is just understanding what valuation. We always say valuation is a condition, not a catalyst. So what is the catalyst? When we look at um, equity markets um, and uh, in general, what we want to see is, one, is, is it oversold or overbought? That's one condition. What are the relative earning trends? So one of the reasons why the U.S. has outperformed other markets is the earnings momentum is much stronger than the rest of the globe. So if that shifts, that would change our review. And then we also listen to the, the, the message of the market relative price trends. So typically when we see two out of the three of those factors move one way, that leads us to, 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 to change our position. Right now, going back to large cap, large caps have a lot more technology than small caps. So you would need technology to weaken. Right now, technology is rich, the earnings momentum is really strong, and the relative price momentum is still really strong as well. So we're staying overweight there. If we start seeing some cracks in those earning trends, we would shift our position. Keith, you alluded to a moment ago some of the international inputs that we also have to continue to consider here. S&P Global had actually put out their, their China PMI reading this morning as well here, signaling expansion and the overall pace of expansion remains very subdued. Business expectations in particular continue to run far below long-term averages, prompting firms to trim their headcount for a third successive month in November. How does this all translate into some of the most exposed, perhaps, U.S. traded companies that are in a lot of people's portfolios out there? Yeah, well, I do think it, it, it does put some risk to some of those earnings that have high exposure to China. Mm -hmm. um, but I would also say, if you would even take a kind of zoom back a little bit, 
one of our biggest, you know, most convicted calls of the last year has been to, <clears throat> excuse me, be underweight emerging markets. In fact, in our core portfolios, we've had zero exposure. And part of that is China is about 30% of the emerging market index. And what's also interesting, if, you know, we all talk about the tech names here doing really well. China tech names are almost close to, to relative lows. So I would say the main, one of the main things up front is still be overweight to the U.S. And then within the U.S., more specific to your question is understand where their exposure is and are they actually are they making steps to move some of that business to other areas uh, outside of China. We're seeing foreign direct investment really come out of China for the first time in about 20 years. We expect that likely continues. Keith, just to give this conversation a little bit of a, a circular ending here, at the start of the conversation, you mentioned just because the calendar year changes doesn't mean our strategy entirely changes here. But at the end of the day, I, I've been thinking through and compiling some chief investment officer New Year's resolutions from folks like yourself across the industry here. If there's one kind of resounding thought that you take into the next year, what would it be? You know, I, I wouldn't say the most important thing is to stay agile. You know, everyone has these outlooks that they put out about where the market's going to be 12 months from now. I mean, if I asked you, Brad, where the market's going to be on September 13th, you'd say, I have no idea. More importantly is have a basis for your view and adjust as the data shifts over time. That's what we've done over time. We've been successful at doing so, you know, in general. And I think just stay agile and follow the way of the evidence. All right, Keith Lerner, always great to get your perspective, your insight, and the New Year's resolution. And always great to talk to you, Drew, as co-chief investment officer. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023. But what's going to take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now, this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it cost, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan. But I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. Four months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024.
J.M. Smucker out with its fiscal 2024 second quarter results. The company, which recently acquired Hostess Brands, saw a rise in comparable net sales boosted by higher volume and price increases, though on the whole overall sales taking a hit from planned divestitures as the company looks to realign its brand portfolio. We are joined now by J.M. Smucker Company CEO Mark Smucker. Great to always speak with you, Mark, and you've always got some jelly themed or colored or nod to some type of jelly in a blazer format. We appreciate you for that consistency, my friend. At the end of the day here, you know I got to start with the Uncrustables division here. I mean, we saw an amazing kind of performance here, and I think it continued to showcase something among the consumer. Perhaps you can give us a little bit more details around what you're seeing in the consumer, and if this is a consumer that's flowing more into the frozen food aisle purchases right now, as evidenced through some of the results with Uncrustable. Yeah, Brad, thank you guys for having me. And, and thanks for starting with Uncrustables. It's a, a great product. It continues to grow. It's, it's been double digits for years now. It's going to eventually be a billion dollar brand in a, in a couple of years. We're building our third plant. We actually just started advertising on Uncrustables and uh, Monday Night Football a couple of weeks ago. So it was the first time we've advertised in about 10 years. And so that, that, product is really taking advantage of snacking occasions, right? And so it's a very convenient, no mess product that parents love to give their kids, that, that athletes like to, to consume as well. And it fits right in with our, our whole snacking strategy, which of course now includes Hostess. And Mark, when it comes to uh, what you saw outside of Uncrustables, that was a huge hit here for you during the quarter. Some of your higher product pricing and the easing pressure that you saw on input costs really helping drive some of the results here on this most recent quarter. I'm curious, just from a pricing perspective, how much pricing power do you still have at this point? You talk about the fact that maybe consumers are starting to trade down just a bit. Do you have any wiggle room to further raise prices? You know, we, we have been very prudent as we've raised prices across our entire portfolio. Our entire portfolio is actually performing exceptional, exceptionally well as we've reshaped it. Um, recently, though, we actually took a price decline on coffee because commodity costs have come down, and that gives a little, uh, takes a little pressure off the consumer. And so we're really pleased to be able to pass along a decrease on coffee. Even as you think about some of the acquisitions that you've made, and you mentioned Hostess, you know, what type of accretive nature do you expect that to give to the business near term? And, and what kind of changes do you believe are necessary for Smucker to implement at Hostess? So first of all, Hostess is a great brand. It, it fits perfectly with our strategy of leading brands and growing categories. And so they clearly are a leader in the sweet baked snacks area. We have very complementary capabilities. We've spent a lot of time building our prowess in marketing and our execution at store level. They have great uh, skills and talent in innovation cycles as well as the convenience store channel. So there are definitely opportunities for both companies to come together and actually benefit each other. And we're really excited about those. Mark, what's your assessment of the consumer? Because there is a lot to be optimistic about, obviously, within your business. But I would guess it's a very challenging time. How are you navigating what could be a tough couple of months? You know, consumers, there are some consumers out there that are seeking value. Our portfolio, regardless of the category, whether it's coffee, pet snacks, handheld snacking, sweet baked snacks, all of those categories, we play in the entire spectrum of value. So value brands like Folgers, all the way up to Duncan and Bustello in the coffee space, even within Milkbone, our, our pet snacks, there are both value and premium offerings. And so we're able to actually move and capture the consumer where they need to be and really want to make sure that we're meeting their needs. So even though there are some premium items that continue to grow, we are also seeing that, that value consumer and capturing uh, and providing them with products that they need as well. Mark, it seems like some of the weight loss drugs and the, the trend there that we've seen of GLP-1s among consumers too, 
that's presented a headwind for snacking as a whole. And we've heard that come up as a theme time after time again with some of the grocery retailers over the course of this earnings season. How is that kind of trickling through to your business? How is that kind of playing itself out in even what your production looks like, the wholesale partnerships and where people are taking on inventory and that assessment that you have to think about on a day in day out basis? Yeah, you know, we haven't seen any meaningful impact at this point. Of course, we're watching that very carefully, and, and we're in the business to serve consumers. So we want to listen to them, to what they need. If you think about our broader portfolio, we have products that will meet the needs of consumers across, again, the value spectrum, but also in the snacking space, consumers continue to snack more than they used to. And often that's a sweet snack. Sometimes it's a, a sweet coffee beverage. Even in the Hostess line, there are opportunities for portion control. The, the products come individually wrapped. You have bite-sized offerings. So we're going to continue to innovate and listen to the consumer and make sure that the products that we're providing are meeting their needs. And that may even include Vortman cookies, which is part of the Hostess portfolio, a, a zero-sugar alternative. So very, very uh, broad portfolio and able to, to meet those needs of the consumer. Mark, are you at all thinking about maybe smaller packaging when it comes to the number of items within some of these boxes, within some of your offerings because of the impact of weight loss drugs potentially? You know, yes, and, and we've already done some of that. If you Again, if you look at the Hostess line, there are alternatives of whether they're individually wrapped or bite-sized alternatives, mm -hmm. but, but there are other alternatives like, like peanut butter, which is obviously a higher protein, vegetable protein, very affordable. So we think our portfolio can play across all of those uh, need states. Just don't make the Twinkies smaller, please. Please, Mark. <laughs> That's all Brad's asking for today, at least. All right, Mark Smucker, always great to talk to you here. James Smucker, company CEO. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Well, December's first full week of trading off to a rocky start. Now, it's a signal that investors may be coming back to reality after an epic rally in November. Optimism around 2024 interest rate cuts boosting markets in November, but traders may now be realizing that they've overestimated or maybe a, were a bit too optimistic about the path ahead. Joining us now for more Yahoo Finance is Jared Blickery. And Jared, what are you seeing on the charts? Well, I think you nailed it. Uh, November it was epic, it was blistering, and now we're taking a little bit of a pause. This is a chart of the S&P 500 going back to 2018, and uh, these little shaded lines here occur when the number of components uh, reaches 30% overbought. So 30% of the components, 150 stocks out of, the, out of the 500 here, have to be overbought with respect to RSI. Now that's relative strength indicator, don't need to get into the wonky uh, lingo there, but when that gets to 70, that is a signal that there may be some profit taking. Now, there's a famous statement on Wall Street, uh, things can get more overbought and more irrational longer than we can remain solvent. And so we got to keep that in mind. Things can get overbought and stay that way for a while. But you can see here, a lot of these uh, prior instances captured nearly perfectly, not all of them, but some of them, uh, with a few weeks uh, to months notice of a major downturn. Doesn't have to happen, doesn't have to happen today. But uh, let me just show you this other piece of evidence here, which is, how much bullish sentiment there is in the market that may be getting a little bit too bullish. Here we have the bulls and bears. This is the AAII weekly bull bear survey. This purple line here is the number of bulls. This blue line here is the number of bears. And you can see bulls are getting stronger in numbers, bears are getting weaker. And when this gets to an extreme, that can also be a contrary signal. But we are not there just yet. Now, I want to focus on a longer term signal, which is the VIX. Now, the VIX is at, has been at 12, 13, 14, 15. It's been hovering mostly under there for the last few months. And when that happens, we see the S&P 500 rally. This goes all the way back to 1986. And we can see these periods here when the VIX was at 15. They tend to be long. Um, there was a one off here, so it could be a similar situation. But I think the messaging is we are primed to head, not necessarily in December, but at least in the, year, in the new year, materially higher. 
Um, I want to bring it back to what's happening right now in the S&P 500, market cap versus equal weighted. We talk about the Magnificent Seven leaving the 400, uh, S&P 493 behind, and this shows that the equal weight, the other 493, have really caught up over the last 10 days. Now, you take a look at the year to date, and this really shows the bifurcation. This top line is a regular S&P 500 market cap. That's what we're used to seeing, up 19%. The equal weight, which is finally starting to catch up, has been languishing since that March correction that we had uh, due to the internet bank part, uh, uh, excuse me, internet bank crisis. Uh, just kind of rounding it out here, I'm going to close with a look at the sectors, and this is what's happened year to date. Tech by far and away the best off, 47.8 percent. But let me show you what's happened over the last five days. Taken a little bit of a tumble. Here is XLC down 2%. You can really see this in the NASDAQ on a five day uh, basis here. You're going to see the mega caps under some water. And over the last 10 days, looks like uh, Meta down 6%, NVIDIA down 8%. This could be just normal sector rotation. I'm not worried about it. Long term prospects for the bull rally are still here, but short term, very short term, might need to uh, just kind of churn a little bit. We'll have to see what happens. All right. If you're not worried about it, I'm not worried about it. Jared, no. appreciate it. Thanks so much. <laughs> All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Boeing is poised to have its first up year in four, and it's been one of the best performers in the Dow. Analysts have gotten more bullish, and the company recently bested its longtime rival Airbus with orders at the Dubai Air Show. But troubles at Boeing's supplier spirit, Aerosystems have dogged its manufacturing process. Are those in the rearview mirror? Is the Boeing rebound for real, and does it belong in your portfolio? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
With the Hollywood strike now in the rearview mirror, companies are looking ahead to 2024 to catch up on content. But with Apple and Paramount reportedly eyeing a bundle in Disney's proxy battle, what will 2024 bring for the streaming giants? Mark Debobos, who is the Brightco CEO, joins us now. Mark, great to have you here in studio with us. What does this set up now that you've got some of the labor negotiations and collective bargaining in the rearview mirror for content production going forward? Yeah, thanks, Brad. Great to be here. Um, Look, I think with the strike ending, you're going to see a ramp up in production, but I think that ramp is going to be slightly slower than we've seen before, right? There has been effectively an overinvestment in content to build up these streaming powerhouses, right? They've built up huge subscriber bases, meaningful growth over the last few years. So many of them continue to grow at, at double digits, but the amount of content they put into those services have created a deep you know, set of losses at many of those companies that they need to trim. So I think you're going to see you know, a ramp up post strike, but I think you're going to see that be uh, a slower ramp up, right? With that, that billions and billions, hundreds of billions spent on content coming down a little bit year over year mm. over time. And Mark, when it comes to the fact that so many of these companies overspent, but in your words, when it comes to content, we've seen those losses really <clears throat> be a theme here over the last uh, several quarters. We also started to see more bundling and we're seeing more and more companies, it seems by the month that are trying everything they can to lower those churn rates. Do you think that's going to work? And I guess, what does that signal just in terms of, is this the first step to broader consolidation? Yeah, so look, I think they are certainly looking at bundling as a way to reduce churn or a way to impact you know, how they can retain those customers longer, longer term. But at the end of the day, you're going to see those ARPUs come down as you do those bundles, right? That ARPU being average revenue per user. So I think at the end of the day, they're going to give consumers a lot of different choices over the next few years. You're seeing Max and Netflix come together on Verizon's Plus Play. You see the rumor about uh, My Old Shop, Paramount Plus, and, and, uh, and Apple coming together. I think ultimately the long term, those, those channel storefronts that you see on Amazon and Apple and others, and I think many other technology platforms will start to bring together a lot of consumer option, right? You'll have multiple choices of where to go. Uh, and you'll have multiple choices of what bundle to create on your own. And I think that's going to be a really uh, great opportunity for consumers. Hopefully it reduces that churn. But at the end of the day, these services are going to need to find a way to be more efficient with the spend that they're doing. Yeah, Mark, how much pricing power do you think a lot of these streamers still have? The fact that they need to rely maybe a little bit more heavily on some of these bundles, trying to lower the costs. Are we almost near that maxing out point when it comes to pricing, at least for now? I think it's going to depend on the content and what you put in each service, right? You've seen Netflix have meaningful power to go to almost $20 on, a, on an average you know, subscriber, and you're seeing others go the other way with lower-priced ad-supported services. So I think you're going to see a spectrum. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Ultimately, though, the, the idea that they all do need to save money on creating these services, and that's both in content and in technology. And, you know, I, I took the job as the CEO of Brightco 18 months ago with the idea that we could help these companies save some money on their infrastructure. They didn't all need to create the service bespoke on, you know, on their own platforms. And it's not just the big six. There are hundreds of these companies around the world in each territory and in each, in each area. It's also been the year of the advertising tier, too, over these past 12 sure. months, too. Is it, is it clear whether there's a, a, queer, a clear winner in that, in this early onset, that's being able to woo marketers and advertisers and get some of those dollars to kind of offset where, you know, some of the users perhaps are saying, you know what, we don't, we, we don't even want to see the ad, so we'll either pay up or we'll pay into that advertising tier and pay less. Look, I, I love that that's happened. I think the fast revolution, the free ad-supported streaming television revolution with Roku Channel and the likes of Samsung TV Plus and others has really ramped up the opportunity for advertising on these services. So you'll see each subscription service also have an ad-supported with lower price tier over time. I think each one will do it. Uh, I think the idea there is, by the way, the winner is streaming overall, right? You see it ticking up in terms of market share overall in terms of consumption. And I think we almost incorrectly look at it as like, well, broadcast is you know flat and cables down and streaming's up. It's just, this is the new form of distribution and what is going to be the future globally. And so you're gonna see every type of business model laid into that distribution format. And so having a strong ad supported service and a capability uh, to be able to deliver that to you is gonna be key. And you're seeing it in the ad dollar shift, right? You're seeing ad dollars shift to that CTV platform uh, now in a meaningful way over the past few years. Mark, how is the industry thinking about or assessing maybe the risk associated with AI preparing themselves and their platforms 
for that risk, I, I would assume, obviously, and you can just see what's played out even within the uh, strike negotiation, certainly a massive story and one that could have a huge impact here on in the industry. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, in the strike, you got to, you got some protections in the yeah. settlement, right? So they're not going to be creating actors out of, you know, zero cloth. Thank goodness. And, and making them go that way. Yes, you guys are real. I'm real. We're really here in the studio. For now. But for now. <laughs> um, so I think that part, you know, it, the, I don't want to say the genie's back in the bottle, but at least there's some protections for those folks that are, you know, the core to working uh, content. But I do believe AI is going to have a huge impact on how these services operate inside, right? So you think about how they are optimizing which content to show and how to show. I mean, we have an analytics package at our company that both optimizes where you put your ads and how many ads you put in the stream. It optimizes how your content is performing versus the rest of your content and other folks' content in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. But I think the big concern I have and we have as a company is the security of that and the amount of copyrighted material that's being used to educate these models, right? And so we take a very uh, specific approach to making sure that our, the way we implement AI is secure for our customers, right? That their content and their IP is not being shared in a model that they are not aware of mm -hmm. or not clear that that's what's driving the answer. And I think that's gonna be paramount uh, to the future of how this is implemented on these services. The actors uh, and the writers were able to get protections on generative AI, but does that mean for advertisers that they are not going to be leveraging that technology in order to leverage the data sets that they already have access into and the hyper-targeting ability within many of these platforms to then say, okay, we've got a, a generative AI advertisement that we can serve up a different experience to anybody who's Yeah, and I, and I think that starts with knowing where, when, and how long to put advertising into a piece of sure. content. Where you have to optimize that for effectively the, the strongest RPM, right? The revenue per user per thousand views. And the way you're going to do that is by checking how that performance is. Sometimes, you know, you put too many ads in there, you're scaring those users away. You put too few ads, you could have maximized revenue in a different way. So it starts with knowing how much, when, where to put that ad. Then you say, who am I targeting? Do I have that data? Do I legally have that data? Because obviously the privacy rules have changed meaningfully over the past few years, especially in Europe and internationally, but even, even so here in the US. So with this, this cookie-less future that we're all dealing with, that first party data is going to be key. You own that data in your service. So that's why I, you know, I think these services are going to remain hybrid, right? The subscriber uh, uh, portion of it will give you that data in order to enable a better advertising service. And, we're not there yet. I mean, we all see repeated ads. We all see the, the, the wrong things coming out of many of these services. I think that will improve over time as we get better with the data and with, with what it can tell us. Mark de Beauvoir, great to have you here in studio. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us, CEO of Brightco. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Well, Purdue Pharma and thousands of opioid victims now await a decision from the Supreme Court as the billionaire Sackler family looks to protect themselves from future opioid-related liabilities using a bankruptcy maneuver. Here to tell us about this, Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan. Alexis. Hi, guys. Yeah, so this case is all about whether a non-party to a bankruptcy can get the benefits of bankruptcy without really putting their eggs in the basket, putting their money in the basket, and actually filing themselves. So uh, the justices yesterday at the Supreme court. They heard arguments from Purdue, um, from also claimants. Now, the company, the reason why it went into bankruptcy, the major reason is because it was facing thousands upon thousands of mass tort claims. These are litigants who said the Oxycontin makers uh, opioids caused them injury, caused the, the families of the victims that caused them death. Uh, so these are major claims, and the company was facing quite a lot of liabilities there. Now, the company and the family, after filing for bankruptcy in 2019, they went ahead and negotiated a $4.5 billion settlement to pay all these claims also to states and local governments and uh, tribal governments. They negotiated this, uh, this settlement of 4.5 that eventually went to $6.5 billion with a lot of pressure that some of the states were holdouts, some of these litigants were holdouts. They didn't want to settle for that figure. But the U.S. trustee, which is a watchdog for the Justice Department in bankruptcy cases, they went ahead and filed, they're not a party, by the way, to these transactions, to say, no, 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 this is not the way that Congress meant to have the bankruptcy law operate. A non-party should not be able to step in and then get a release in these settlements from all future civil liabilities. And that's what the Sackler family wants here. Now, the Sackler family that owned and controlled the company up until the bankruptcy, they have negotiated in a, a freedom from future lawsuits. And most of the litigants, they want this. Most of the claims
claimants. 95% of them want it, though there are some holdouts that would like to still be able to go ahead, have their day in court, and sue the family. This deal would wipe that right out for these people. Um, but the Sacklers, the judges uh, had this discussion in court saying, look, the, the family members, they transferred what amounted to approximately $11 billion out of the company before the bankruptcy. And this is one of the reasons why it doesn't have enough money to pay these liabilities. So a really interesting argument here uh, and really will have uh, ramifications for the future of who can get protection in these big corporate bankruptcies going forward. And you heard back from Purdue Pharma. What did they have to say and, and what comes next now? Right. So they said they were glad to have their day in court. They think they had, uh, you know, the law on their side. They said our creditors who insisted on the third party releases at issue over and overwhelmingly support our plan underscored to the court that this plan is the only way to deliver billions of dollars toward life-saving opioid abatement programs and victim compensation. Big argument in this case uh, that they're talking about here is that, look, let's not spend a lot of money litigating these matters. Let's put the money in a basket and start distributing it to these litigants, these claimants who were injured, who want it, and also to the states and the governments for these abatement programs. Right, huge case there. Alexis, thanks so much for keeping tabs on that and bringing that to our attention here. Yahoo Finance's own Alexis Keenan. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023. But what's going to take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now, this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18. But we're in New York City, and I added pepperoni. So it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan, but I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. Four months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024.
The IPO market has been somewhat hit and miss in 2023. Despite some high-profile listings, things haven't gone exactly according to plan for some of the larger companies that went public. Arm and Instacart are two in particular that had disappointing debuts in September. The latter seeing a big plunge on just the second day of trading that wiped out almost all of its IPO gains. Oh, and the big clog maker out there, Birkenstock, was another big name listing this year. Only just traded above its IPO price recently. The recent market bounce has seen a host of new contenders step into the fore with the likes of Shein gearing up for what some are calling a mega IPO in the next coming months. Here, our next guest says hope abounds for 2024. Joining us now, we've got Christine Short, Wall Street Horizon VP of Research. Christine, great to have you here in studio with us. Help us really get a kind of gaze here on what is expected within the IPO market. And, you know, even as we've seen some of the lulls over the course of this year, what's expected to be the catalyst? And if there's one sector that really kind of leads us. Yeah, so like you said, uh, we came into the summer and I think we wrote about it. A lot of people wrote about it after Kava, um, after uh, Savers Value Village. And mm -hmm. it was like, this is the resurgence. We're coming in the second half of the year. This is where we're going to see IPO activity reignite. That didn't really materialize, right, with a few of the names that you talked about. Not only did those names not do particularly well, but we didn't see this kind of uptick in activity. In Q4 right now, we've only seen about 52 IPO announcements. That's the lowest Q4 in, in over seven years. So what's the catalyst going forward? Well, this summer, a lot of those IPOs didn't do well because of uh, uncharacteristic volatility, as well as higher interest rates, right? We know risky assets don't do well in a high interest rate market. Um, but if you look at the CME Group's FedWatch tool, there are some anticipation that we're going to see quite a few cuts in the first half of the year. I think that gives private companies kind of the gusto they need to go forward and potentially um, debut when maybe they just were too shy at the end of this year. We're seeing there's been lots of focus on whether or not we could see Shein go public next year, whether or not Reddit could also potentially be in the mix. What do you see just in terms of how likely it is that some of those larger companies, one that we have been waiting for now yep. to go public for quite some time, that they're actually going to jump in? Skims as well. Yeah, Skims is another one. Um, I think that all depends on what we see out of jobs on Friday, mm -hmm. because that will determine probably what the Fed the language that they give, are they going to be a little more dovish finally if jobs numbers come in weaker than expected? All of this, I really think, depends on interest rates in the first half of the year. Like I said, FedWatch tool expecting about three cuts until the June meeting. And so I think that, again, would give those companies kind of the reassurance to go in. Um, look, it's been a challenging environment for IPOs this year, right? Like tighter capital markets, like I said, volatility, higher interest rates. So no one's really quite been ready to jump in, especially those consumer names and those tech names. Those are the ones that we've particularly seen get hit. And I would actually say Birkenstock is one that's doing a little bit better than the rest, right? A few of these are head scratchers. Savers Value Village, when that came out, everyone's a like, great environment for them. Right. This Thrift is what we're hanging our head on. <laughs> right. Like, oh, second secondhand clothing is making like, you know, pretty big comeback. Yeah. The consumer is very value focused mm -hmm. right now. They're going to do great, but they're down like 33% since their debut. So that one, as well as Kava, right? Like one consumer area that has been doing well is dining, is restaurants. But you know, when you see Kava perform as it has, it makes maybe someone like a Panera who has been rumored to re-IPO, right? They used to be public. They got taken private in 2017. They're rumored for 2024, but they're probably looking very closely at Kava's performance right now. As you kind of look across the board, what, what is the general kind of balance sheet health for some of these companies that have been sitting on the sidelines waiting for the right time to enter into the public markets right now? Yeah, I mean, I really just think they're, they're again, looking at interest rates. They're looking at what peers in the space are doing. Um, here's another one that I think has actually done better than expected or um, arm holdings. Uh, we were actually expecting them to do much better, but they're they're slowly creeping out of that, right? Like they're only down, I think, 2.5% from their debut. What are they looking at? Well, the industry as a whole, the semiconductors have been doing incredibly well. If you look at some of the partnerships on the horizon there, NVIDIA, AMD, so that sets them up to do quite well going forward. So I think they're just looking at the overall uh, market for, for IPO debuts. Again, investors sort of shy away in these high interest rate markets. Also, we talked a little bit about some of the IPO lockup expiration dates that are coming up for those June debuts from Kava, Savers Value Village, um, Kodiak Gas. Um, you also had Fidelis Insurance. Those are coming up and investors need to be aware of those because it puts them at risk, right? If insiders can now go ahead and sell six months after, 
Does the market get flooded with shares? Does the stock price go down? So we're going to be watching some of those names next week. Christine, in terms of the sector activity, because I'm taking a look at this chart that has the last 12 months, you have technology, healthcare, industrials, consumer discretionary even, among the sectors that we saw the most activity in over the last year. What do you think is likely to lead next year? Is it going to be some of those consumer discretionary, maybe retail names? Yeah, I think retail's not a bad one. I mean, tech's just been doing so well, especially those mega tech names have served really as a safe haven. Mm -hmm. uh, we call 2023 was sort of the year of uncertainty. Obviously, it was a, a good year for markets, but you could see investors were sort of uncertain where to put their money. Volume was low many months. Um, volatility, all of this showed us that investors were like, in wait and see mode and that's why you saw the magnificent seven do well it's like oh, i'll just plunk my money in those those are like likely to do quite well and in this environment sure ipo debuts haven't done as well but i think you see tech i see think you see certain areas of consumer discretionary lead next year and you still have a, a few of the tech giants if you will in the generative ai space that are still privately traded even though or private companies at the end of the day even though they've gotten billions of dollars in the case of open ai yep that has been thrust their way from some of the large equity market players. You've got a, a company in Hugging Face that is very generative AI focused. Is there a broader theme within artificial intelligence that you expect perhaps to also kind of take on some of the attention when we think about companies that could start talking about going public next year? Yeah, I mean, they, they don't necessarily have to, depending on what phase sure. they're in, right? Like, they're, they're doing well enough, they're getting the funding, mm -hmm. um, and they're probably looking at what peers in the space, what NVIDIA, what Microsoft, what other other names are doing. So, of course, that's going to be a focus again for, for 2024, um, and so we're certainly looking at, at AI as well. Christine Short, Wall Street Horizon VP of Research, joining us here on set. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks so much. We're all going to be watching closely. Big IPOs next year. Big IPO energy, hopefully. Um, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance, everyone. Boeing is poised to have its first up year in four, and it's been one of the best performers in the Dow. Analysts have gotten more bullish, and the company recently bested its longtime rival Airbus with orders at the Dubai Air Show. But troubles at Boeing's supplier spirit, Aerosystems, have dogged its manufacturing process. Are those in the rearview mirror? Is the Boeing rebound for real, and does it belong in your portfolio? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
Charging up, Tesla is grabbing plenty of headlines and dividing skeptics and fans. Akiko Fujito and Rochelle Kufo are going to speak with one analyst who calls the vehicle genius engineering wrapped in controversial design. Plus, a closer look at just how many consumers are actually interested in the divisive truck. You don't want to miss it. And your mom got a ride in it, right? Uh, I believe one of my it? parents did. Yeah, I got a text message. I haven't seen photos. Photos or it didn't happen, mom and dad. I know, I was going to say, I have, I have yet to see one in person, but I got a lot of thoughts on the design. Really? Yeah, I'm not, big, I'm not a huge fan. In 60 seconds or less, thoughts on the design? You know, I just think it's too much a back to the future sort of thing. Okay. It doesn't really have that sexy curb appeal that maybe you would be looking for if you're going to be paying upwards of $100,000 for got a pickup truck on angles the top. Are sexy. It does have, okay, but I'm just not, I'm not a fan. But maybe. If I sit in the vehicle, I might feel differently. So I shouldn't judge, a, judge it before I actually see it. <sighs> yeah. We'll see. I was watching a few of the crash tests uh, that are now going viral uh, over X or Twitter, whatever you're calling it, at your household. That is itself a divisive argument at many households. <laughs> so at the end of the day, um, yeah, just more videos that are coming out. I was watching MKBHD and his review. So I got a few more videos to watch right now. There's a heck of a lot of fans out there and yeah. people who are standing by and saying that it is the next huge thing. So we will see. All right, quick check of the markets here before we let you go. You're still looking at a mixed picture following the data that was out this morning on jobs and also the services sector. You're looking at the Dow off just about 100 points. S&P and NASDAQ, though, holding on to gains. Akiko and Rochelle have you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's gonna take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan. But I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. Four months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching so far this morning. Job openings decreased to 8.7 million in the month of October, hitting the lowest level since 2021. A further signs of a cooling labor market ahead, we'll discuss. And charging up, Tesla's Cybertruck is now available for delivery, but how are consumers really feeling about it? We'll speak with one analyst calling it, quote, genius engineering wrapped in controversial design. And speaking of controversial, Linda Yaccarino's first six months at X were anything but smooth as the social media company now faces advertising setbacks. Is more trouble ahead? We'll break that down later this hour. But first, let's take a look at how markets are faring so far this morning. Looking at a mixed picture here, as we saw on that jolts data hitting that lowest level since 2021. We're seeing the Dow currently off about 0.2% or about 70 points there. The S&P 500 just in positive territory, but relatively flat as well. Tech heavy Nasdaq, though, leading the way there, up almost 100 points on the day or 0.7%. Well, let's also see what that, that news did to the Treasury markets as well. Looking at the five-year yield, as you can see, currently at 416, down about 1.7%. The 10-year hitting a three-month low, the yield there. Currently down about 2% on the day, sitting at 42. And looking at the longest term, 30-year yield also down about two and a quarter percent on the day, currently sitting at 434. Well, we got our first peek at how the labor market changed in the last month with the JOLTS report showing a loosening in the, in the jobs market. Now, job openings fell more than expected to 8.7 million on the last day of October. Now, this comes ahead of, of course, the big jobs report on Friday. We have our very own Jared Blakery here to break down the information and, of course, the market impact. Hey, Jared. Hey, Rochelle. Uh, spoil the, uh, I'll give you a uh, spoiler alert. There was not much uh, market impact. However, uh, the big news, I think, is that the direction is still down in terms of new openings and also the revisions are down. Uh, we are looking at a revised number of 9.35 million and then we are 8.7 million, so a drop of about, I don't know, 500,000 in the space of that one month period. And this is two months ago, so we're only looking at uh, October's numbers. And of course, this Friday, we're going to get the November payroll numbers. And then a month later, we'll get the November JOLTS report. But let's stick with this for a second. Um, if you look at the number of job openings for each person who's looking at work, that's a key ratio. That was at 2% at the very top here. That was over the pandemic, 2021. Everybody was quitting and getting better paying jobs. Well, that is down to 1.3 right now. And that's pretty close to the long 
long-term average of 1.2. That was uh, 2019, so that was before the pandemic. So the labor market has definitely cooled. And another indication is the quits rate. You can see that's down to 2.3% from the peak up here. And people are just not feeling as able to quit their jobs and perhaps get another job that pays better. Uh, just digging inside the report, I think it was interesting to note that the declines were seen mainly in healthcare and social, social assistance. Those were down 236,000. Finance and insur insurance, real estate rentals and lease leasing. And for all the talk about tech layoffs, tech field actually increased 39,000. So maybe all that hubbub about the Magnificent Seven is warranted. But let's take a look at the market impact. I was watching the tape at 1 p. Uh, excuse me, at 10 a.m. when the news dropped. There is the Dow. You can see barely a movement in there. Um, let's see the NASDAQ real quick. Not too much more. We actually did get a little bit of a rise in the NASDAQ, so some contrary motions there. Maybe because the tech sphere is so good that they are hiring more. If we take a look at the S&P 500, kind of a combination of the two, but you can see at least the S&P 500 is in the green right now. And of course, when you have a data-dependent Fed, every little bit matters. But former Fed economist Claudia Sam recently said that these surveys that they gather information for jolts, inflation, home prices, may not be getting the full picture as response rates for the Bureau of Labor Statistics are tumbling. So does that change how we weigh this data? Yeah, if you can't if you can't count people accurate, accurately, how are you going to produce these statistics? And this is the uh, rate we can see before the pandemic. This goes all the way back to 2014, so tw 10 years. It was at 60 percent. It has now dwindled to it looks like about 40 percent, maybe a little bit below that. Uh, so this has been an issue for the BLS. And what it does is it makes the reports more erratic, and then it makes the market reaction surrounding these reports more erratic as well. So it kind of feeds in and of itself. Now, all these reports that we're talking about from the BLS, these are revised uh, each year and they are taken to a, a very high level of accuracy. However, until we get to that point, we can still have a lot of variations. And I think that's where a lot of the stories, especially if you're on Twitter, uh, you see this theme quite a bit. So. The numbers uh, that we're looking for Friday, I think we're looking for something like 180,000 payrolls. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but that would be up from 150,000. There's still a lot of hope in the jobs market. And uh, rate cuts are getting priced in for next year, in part because of this softening of the labor market. However, I would add, uh, when the labor market softens and it really softens, that just happens really quickly within the span of a month or two. And it doesn't really give the Federal Reserve time to react. So people that think the Fed is just going to be trimming 25, 50 basis points, no, it would probably be more like 100 or 200 basis points if history is any guide, guys. Certainly got to be aware of those knee-jerk reactions. Appreciate you breaking that down for us, our very own Jared Blickery. Well, the stock market experienced a November to remember, with the Dow and the S&P 500 both closing the month up just shy of 9%, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq gained almost 11%. Now, investors apparently seized the moment to take some profits. According to TD Ameritrade's November Investor Movement Index, clients at the firm were net sellers, exiting some of the year's biggest gainers and rotating into stocks that have fallen out of favor. Well, joining us now with more on this is Joe Mazzola, Director of Trading and Education at Charles Schwab. Thank you for joining us this morning. So break this down for us. Given the outsized impact that the Magnificent Seven have had so far this year, is this the right time to be taking those profits? So I think the story really is sell the rip and buy the dip. So sell the stocks that had ripped up. As you mentioned, the Magnificent Seven, I think that's what our clients did. And they bought the dip on some of the underperforming stocks, underperforming sectors. And it's really kind of what you're seeing in the market as a whole right now, uh, kind of a movement underneath the surface where, yeah, just like just as you mentioned, you know, can you pare back some of those gains and look for some underperformers to maybe lock in a little bit of alpha as we uh, head towards the end of the year? I think that's what clients were doing especially in interest rate sensitive stocks, uh, you know, our, our biggest purchase or our biggest client purchase over that uh, that course of the month of November was Realty Income, uh, letter O. And you want to talk about interest rate sensitive, uh, you know, they're front and center. And the, when you look at the Magnificent Seven, there was something of a split in, some, in the things that some of the clients sold when you look at, say, your Amazon versus your Apple. Why the divergence there? How are some of these these investors feeling about these right now? I think the divergence really occurred from uh, the movement that those stocks had, uh, you know, post earnings. You know, you saw 20% you know, moves in some of these names. 
Uh, Netflix got a nice little bounce. Amazon got a nice little bounce. Apple did rally, but not to the, not to the same extent. And so those were, you know, those were some of the stocks that they had paired back. I think they were just trimming winners and looking for opportunities on some of those losers. So we already talked about realty income. Uh, you know, a couple other uh, purchases that we saw were Ford. Uh, which had a nice little bounce off of uh, its earnings in November. But then Tesla, you know, I know you guys were previewing the, the Cybertruck. Uh, you know, Tesla pulled back off a, of, uh, you know, dour earnings, if you will. And uh, our investors or our, our, our clients looked at it as, as that as an opportunity uh, to buy. And they've, and they've had a nice little run since then. And so how are some of, some of these investors feeling about the economy then? What is this signaling, looking right. at what they're coming out of as opposed to just taking profits? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I think the way that you can judge the, the responses that we got in is by looking at the backdrop of kind of what, what was set up uh, at the end of October into November, because you have to remember this investor movement index, it measures actually what they're doing, not what they're saying. And I think their actions kind of speak to you know what had happened. Think about this. Back at the end of October, we still didn't know whether or not uh, we were going to have a Speaker of the House. We didn't know whether or not we were going to pass any budget bills. Uh, we had uh, geopolitical concerns that you know we're still facing today. But then something happened at the beginning of November, and basically what that was. Uh, was there was a big bond short that was out there uh, from the hedge funds. And once that that sh once that short got squeezed and you started to see bonds rally fairly quickly, and then he came in with some, you know, I, I, I would say less hawkish, I wouldn't call it dovish, but some less hawkish uh, speech from Powell, it kind of gave a little bit of rocket fuel to the equities. Uh, and as those interest rates came down very quickly, you know, down basically 60 basis points from where they were, uh, that was really kind of that impetus for uh, our clients to, to look for some of those interest, interest rate sensitive names and pile into those. I'll just give you an example. If you take a look at what's happened in the small cap space recently, uh, you know, the, the Russell has really outperformed uh, the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 within this, you know, this, this last month span. And those are companies that you talk about that are really interest rate sensitive, especially when you're looking at 30% of the Russell companies that are, are non-profitable. So these are companies that are going to have to refinance at some point. They're going to probably be doing it at a higher rate. So anytime you see a, a pretty uh, a precipitous drop in the rates, it does benefit those companies. And so, Joe, for investors who are kind of trying to keep track of some of the market levels they should be watching for, you lay out a couple yeah. here, um, especially yeah. SPX Export looking at 4,500 first, but break down your base case for the ones that you're looking at. Yeah, so I, I, I think I sent you two. I was looking at the S&P 500 and also looking at the Russell because those are the two that interest me the most right now. S&P 500, uh, you know, we, there's, there's a lot of resistance up around 4,600. I hate to use all the round numbers, but I think to a certain extent, that's where we're starting to see it. There's a couple things that I'm looking at. Uh, yeah, and that is, you know, that kind of pushes us back towards the July highs that we saw. Uh, if we can get back above those, I think we got some room up to, you know, potentially 4,800. Uh, it's going to, it's going to take probably the Magnificent Seven participating again to get us up above that. I do like the fact that we've seen some uh, widening of the breadth. Uh, and, you know, as the, as the Magnificent Seven has sold off a little bit, you've actually seen a lot of pickup from some of the other uh, stocks to the point now where we have about 83% of the S&P 500 trading above its 50-day moving average. That's healthy. Then that can set up for uh, a move back up above that level, that 4,600 level. On the downside, I, like I said, I think 4,550 and, and 4,500, those are the two levels that I'd watch first. I think 4,480 is a very important level because that's where you saw that kind of a breakout from that downward trend that we had really been in since July that also intersects with the 100-day moving average there. And if I were to look at the Russell, I think the biggest thing that really happened for the Russell and, and kind of gave that a little bit of that movement to the upside was finally breaking above that 200-day moving average. I mean, something I hadn't been able to do in a long, long time. We got up above that 200-day moving average. And, uh, and where this is a little bit different than, say, the NASDAQ or the S&P 500 is we're not looking at overbought areas right now. We're starting to get a little bit close. Uh, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ got up above that 70 RSI before kind of pulling back a little bit. But we still have some room uh, with the Russell before we get to that level. And we're not even close to uh, the year-to-date the year highs in the Russell. So there might be some more upside there. Certainly imp important to break down, as you mentioned, what people say they're going to do, what they're actually doing with their investments. Right. So appreciate you breaking all of that down for us. Joe Mazzola, Director of Trading and Education at Charles Schwab. Thank you so much. Thank you.
All right, taking a look at shares of Spirit Airlines teetering today, initially falling more than 10% as closing arguments are underway in the Department of Justice's case to block JetBlue's acquisition of a low-cost carrier. JetBlue also dipping today, agreed to a divestiture plan back in September in an attempt to appease regulators. The airliner agreed to sell all of Spirit Airlines assets at Boston and Newark Liberty airports, as well as five gates around ground facilities at Fort Lauderdale's airport to Allegiant. Now, U.S. District Judge William Young has heard arguments for the case over the last month in a Boston federal courtroom, and it will be up to him to make the decision on this merger. We'll be keeping you posted on that. All right, we have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. The rally on home builder stocks hasn't fizzled out just yet. With mortgage rates retreating and inflation abating, where does that leave home builder stocks coming in 2024? Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero with more on the industry's outlook. Danny. Akiko, home builder stocks are on another tear once again, but there are three stocks that are really telling the story here. Lennar is up 44% this year, Pulte Group up. Four, oh, up 100% this year, and DR Horton is up 45% this year. So the gains really do highlight how bullish the attitude is coming from investors. Not only that, 
but home builders have been stepping up their game this year. They, it, during this int high interest rate environment, they've been offering incentives like those mortgage rate buy downs to bring in demand. That mortgage rate buy downs are once you upfront the cost to lower down the rate on the loan. That has been really, really a big incentive across all home builders. But the moves from the home builders are really having Wall Street analysts expect that these public home builders will gain the market share for both new homes and overall transactions. There was a note from BTIG that really highlights this uh, overall scenario. They say out of the 20 publicly traded home builders, that they control nearly 2 million lots. And with today's average for new homes, which is around $478,000, that could equal to $975 billion dollars in future revenue. Cha-ching. But before the cha-ching, there is some headwinds for this sector ahead. They say in this note that the large metros are actually getting a little bit crowded by these public home builders, so there's not that much headroom for there. But the big question overall is, Will the home builders be as successful if there is any rate cuts? They've been very successful in a high interest rate environment, but if that changes next year, what will happen? That's a, we'll have to wait and see on that. Indeed, and something else we'll be waiting for. Toll Brothers reporting Q4 after the bell today. What can investors expect there? Toll Brothers has been really busy at work, especially this year. The third quarter, in the third quarter, they blew past analyst expectations. The CEO, Doug, yearly, he even called out the country's housing stock lousy, a really a big key reason for this home builder, the success on this home builder. The company is forecasting for the fourth quarter to deliver between 2,006, 2,650 and 2,750 units between a, they'll have a price tag, an average of $1 million on that, on those homes. We'll have to wait and see after the bell on what really Toll Brothers comes out with their fourth quarter <laughs> earnings. Rochelle? Certainly be keeping an eye on that. Appreciate you as always. Yahoo Finance reporter Danny Romero. And also looking at crypto continuing to rally. Bitcoin surging past $42,000. This coming amid news that the SEC may approve a spot Bitcoin ETF in early January. Yahoo Finance's very own Brian Sozzi spoke to Robinhood CEO Vlad Tenev about that ETF optimism. Here's what he had to say. There's more optimism around an ETF being approved. Um, there is bad actors like, like Binance. Um, you're kind of continuing to see them being weeded out. Um, and then I think there's also more talk about uh, uh, inflation, right? Uh, as, as inflation becomes a little bit more broadly understood, people are starting to look to long-term inflation hedges. And that, that's been a thesis behind crypto and Bitcoin in particular for quite some time. Um, and there, there has been some pessimism because in certain times it tends to follow the broader NASDAQ and hasn't been super effective as an inflation hedge in those times. But uh, at other times it decouples. So I think there's probably multiple factors driving it. After a busy few years where some high profile crypto lenders have come and gone, Nexo could be considered one of the last biggest players standing. Formed in 2017, it specializes in crypto lending, a segment of the market that's seen at least three major firms, Voyager, Digital, Celsius Network, and BlockFi, all fire for bankruptcy protection, leaving thousands of customers as creditors in ongoing Chapter 11 proceedings. For more on the crypto sector, let's get to Anthony Trencha of Nexo, co-founder. Uh, Anthony, good to talk to you today. Um, you certainly haven't been immune from the shakedown that has played out within the crypto sector. You had to take down a $45 million fine from the SEC. As you think about where crypto is today compared to pre-FTX collapse, you know, pre what happened with Binance, how does that change your strategy? How does that change your thinking about how Nexo moves forward? Well, we have been very focused on building out the infrastructure. This is the great thing about bear markets that you can 
uh, refine your product, your infrastructure, whether this means technology or, um, you know, the legal aspects, licensing and underpinning uh, what underpins the enterprise. That's what have been very focused on this past few years and increasingly uh, so after the FTX collapse, uh, you know, right now, I think we are in a sort of a situation where we have mixed signals. On the one side, we have all the positive things that have happened in the space, you know, uh, the settlement uh, that Binance has, um, the Bitcoin spot uh, ETF that appears to be around the corner. And I'm certainly in the in the camp of believers. And then, you know, we have some. Uh, messages from the Treasury, um, you know, from the SEC that um, they continue to be quite aggressive on crypto and we have to see how it plays out. But ultimately, I'm very optimistic here. And Anthony, we have to talk about this rally that we've seen. How much of that is just about this, this hype around the spot Bitcoin ETF being approved versus looking further ahead to the Bitcoin halving event in 2024? Well, I think it's both. I think Bitcoin is sound fundamentally uh, in the sense that we saw a deleveraging after the FTX uh, collapse. We saw a shakeout of the weak hands and Bitcoin has been transferred to stronger diamond hands, which now will hold on forever. That on the one side. And then just like structurally from, from a market perspective, um, you know, we have the... Um, uh, everybody write Bitcoin off, you know, it was like shows like yours, all but uh, stop talking about Bitcoin for a few months. And, uh, you know, this also tells you a little bit about sentiment and Bitcoin half halving this pre-programmed disinflationary mechanism that Bitcoin has inbuilt in its code. I think it strikes a uh, right note in this uh, inflationary times. And, you know, I think um, this garnered with the, um, uh, with the uh, uh, the Bitcoin spot ETF uh, frenzy is what is ultimately going to propel us from here. If we can hold the 42 level, which is very important, up to 50 in the short short term, um, then there might be some correction and some profit taking and sell the news type of event. But then until the end of year, I definitely could see it go up to uh, 100K uh, at the end of 2024. 100,000 by the end of the year. Um, what's the catalyst? Well, the catalyst would be the Bitcoin halving. Uh, this is certainly what we saw in 2022 when it occurred around uh, the mid of uh, May. Uh, you know, some caution uh, here for you viewers who are about to, you know, go in, uh, in uh, go in all long in crypto with the uh, with with the funds from the the college for, uh, for the, the college tuitions for uh, their children. You know, before that, we saw an intraday. A tank of 50% uh, just prior to the halving, just a few months before that in 2022. So uh, crypto is not a one-way street, but I do see uh, the Bitcoin ETF um, as an institutional draw, as a draw of institutional money, and then the halving uh, will be a huge event. And then if uh, and when the, uh, the, the, uh, the Fed pivots from its... Uh, you know, very aggressive um, hiking cycle and it plateaus out or even starts cutting rates, this will be the ultimate Im impetus for all risk on assets of which Bitcoin is the par excellence. So Anthony, when people are looking at Bitcoin, if it does potentially get to 100,000, will it lift all boats when you look at some of the nuances in other tokens and cryptos, especially when you look at Ethereum, Solana, some of these others, will it lift all boats or is Bitcoin really its own separate story here? Well, listen, I'm personally long both uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. I have been surprised by Ethereum's underperformance this past few months. I think with the move from proof of work to proof of staking and uh, um, the options for genuine yield generation in a in a in a economically sustainable way should have drawn more people into uh, the space i think the frenzy has really like the the last month or so has been around the bitcoin spot etf so that's why bitcoin took the lead here uh, but i do think that in a environment where bitcoin rallies all the way up to 100k it will be um, uh, the tide that lifts all boats and we will see an out season, uh, outgoing season rally ultimately at some point in 2024. Okay, 100,000 by year end. Anthony, we're going to hold you to your call. I have you back on the show. Anthony Trenchev, Nexo co-founder 
Appreciate the time today. Thank you so much. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance. Time now for our chart of the day, looking at Tesla's labor disputes expanding, now escalating in Denmark with the country's largest labor union saying it will pause shipments of vehicles to Sweden in support of those striking workers. The union membership in both Sweden and Denmark are among the highest in Europe, and cross-border strikes are not unheard of in the Scandinavian labor market. And I mean, we know that when we first saw, obviously, the separate UAW strikes in the US, we wondered, you know, could Tesla be a beneficiary here? But a different set of issues when it comes to the unions in Europe. And we heard Elon Musk previously say, look, if we end up having these, com these um, different shops end up unionizing, he, he basically said it's their fault. But it's interesting that, I mean, when you look at the, the Swedish arm, this union, they've already been on strike for six weeks. So then to see this momentum with Denmark, it'll be interesting to see how much broader this goes. Yeah, it certainly points to the challenges of operating as a global company. It's not just about avoiding unions in the U.S. because Tesla is not a union shop, but also um, having to, to, to go with some of those um, union movements in other countries as well. Incidentally, we, we should point out that if, in fact, they aren't able to import through some of these Scandinavian countries, they'd have to do it through Germany, which is a five-hour drive, as I understand it. Um, so that's an additional step for the company, certainly something they want to try and avoid. But one movement that we're going to be watching very closely. Well, Tesla has launched shipments of its 
much anticipated cyber truck, but how are consumers really feeling about it? A new survey from Canaccord Genuity shows that two thirds of respondents say they would not buy Tesla's latest release. George Generikas is Canaccord Genuity Managing Director. He joins us alongside our very own Praz Subramanian. Um, George, good to talk to you today. You know, we had a guest on um, certainly right after the launch of that Cybertruck saying this is essentially a halo truck. It's not expected to generate a lot of revenue. It's the good shining object that Tesla wants to get new consumers in through the door to buy their other cars. How should we be looking at this? Look, um, first, it's incredibly controversial. And we had a, an incredibly robust response to our survey. <clears throat> it was interesting to hear that two thirds didn't want it. And frankly, that was a lot better than we expected. I mean, across my family, it's polarizing. I personally love it. My wife doesn't like it at all. My two daughters are split. Uh, Leanne, who works on our team, doesn't like it. Pino likes it. And it, it, it kind of makes people feel all sorts of different things, just kind of like the CEO of the company. Um, you know, we did a survey, like I said, that revealed that this split was there. But we also spent a lot of time looking at the reviews and trying to understand the underlying technology of the vehicle. And it's incredible. I mean, this is the first company in the world to move to a 48 volt architecture, which enables something called uh, rear wheel steering dr done by drive by wire or steer by wire, which means that you, there's no hand over hand steering over where anymore. You can basically do 170 degree turns with your steering wheel and completely maneuver the vehicle. It's remarkable what the company has been able to do underneath the surface despite the controversial uh, steel exoskeleton. So it's good. we think it'll sell up to a quarter million over the next uh, couple of years, maybe over time half a million. And you know it, it'll move the PNL, but what's more interesting is the way the company continues to move technology forward. Hey, George Pross here. So do you think, Pross. Uh, how you doing, man? So do you think that one of the main reasons why potentially there was some negativity towards it in terms of your survey was because of pricing? Pricing was a bit more uh, expected than what people had seen, at least originally. And, and then secondly, touching on the under the skin features, do you think that'll actually help uh, sentiment if people learn more about that 48 volt system, that rear wheel, wheel steering system, things like that under that kind of controversial skin? So I think the two thirds that didn't like it yet, we, our, sim, our survey was very simple. Would you buy Cybertruck? But if you ask me based on the discussions that I've had individually, which have been probably in the hundreds, it's really the look of the vehicle that either gets people excited or revolts people. You know, it's a, it's really controversial and it's different. And you know, the future should look like look like the future according to Elon Musk. It it excites me. It revolts my wife, for example. So I think it has everything to to do with the way the vehicle looks. Uh, what was your second question again, Pros? I was basically asking about um, mentioning the, the 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 fact that the under the under the skin features are those going to help sort of uh, improved buying sentiment if people understand what's going on with the, the 40 volt architecture and things like that. Totally. I mean, look, uh, it has stuff that you have to get used to, right? There's no uh, rear view mirror. There's an enormous uh, uh, real, uh, I'm sorry, front uh, windshield wiper. There's an enormous windshield. This is all different. You know, I haven't, I've seen the vehicle in person. I haven't driven it, but based on the reviews that I've seen people sort of like it, you know, and also it's incredibly fast, right? It beats a Porsche 911 off the line while carrying a Porsche 911. So I think the technology is going to get people excited. It's different the same way the iPhone was different, uh, different when it first came out, but it's got incredible stuff underneath the hood, so to speak. So George, sort of looking at Tesla big picture here, you know the, the truck you might see is having about 250,000 unit sales down the line. Um, and then below the $80,000, you could get that uh, federal tax credit. Uh, we're hearing now that Tesla is, is anticipating that it's going to lose half that credit for its Tesla Model 3 because of the new rules that Treasury put in place for entities of concern. What's your thoughts on that? And do you think it really will it sort of hurt the brand there or can they actually work around it and, and maybe uh, source some different battery materials for that car? It's a great question. So look, the government is trying to do the right thing here, right? They're trying to induce companies to create a battery manufacturing <clears throat> infrastructure in the United States. And currently some of Tesla's vehicles use batteries from China. 
you know, despite all their efforts to make batteries here in the U.S., and Tesla has been leading that for many, many years, they still use batteries, we think, from CATL in China. Uh, at the end of the day, what really matters here is, in, in our opinion, for the stock, is what they guide to for next year. There's a lot of negative sentiment with regard to what the volumes will look like in 2024. We're at 2.3 million in and in around. You know, there's a lot of whisper out there that they'll be in the low twos. And what this uh, this does, the, the the lack of an incentive is potentially create an air pocket in the first quarter. Maybe it means that the fourth quarter estimates or the the uh, actual volumes are really good because people rush to the store, rush online to buy their Tesla, leaving a little bit of an air pocket. So uh, we'll see how this all shakes out. But at the end of the day, what really matters globally, can Tesla sell 2.3 million plus or minus vehicles next year? And for now, we think the answer is yes. And George, when we factor in the Cybertruck here, Musk himself says it'll take 12 to 18 months before this new vehicle is, quote, a significant positive cash flow contributor. Is this more about sort of the, the halo effect for the brand, getting people into perhaps some of the cheaper models, or is this really targeted at a very sort of small base of early adopters and, and Musk supporters when you think about the Cybertruck and who's investing in it? That's a great question. And, you know, it's not that cheap, right? Like Pras pointed out, it's you know, upwards of uh, the, the the version that's currently available is a hundred thousand dollars, and so it's not that you're not going to get significant volume like like the Model Three or the Model Y. But there's so much interesting technology there that number one, it creates the ha halo effect that you're referring to, and over time, as the sixty thousand dollar version comes out, we think it actually will drive volume, and it, as you can sell it globally. Right now, it's limited to the U.S. or maybe North America, uh, but over time, you know, they get to quarter million maybe half a million, but it's an exciting vehicle that looks different, obviously incredibly controversial. I know some people have called it an art piece that and Elon Musk should just stop production because it's so hard to make. Look, if they're gonna, in our opinion, they're gonna pull it off. They're, it'll initially result in a halo effect. Then look at some of the viral videos on the internet. People are stopping to look at the vehicle on the street. You know, what, when was the last time that happened with a car? I can't think of any. It might have been when Hummus came out, and that, that didn't end so, so great, but that was more about them being, you know, really gas guzzlers here. But, I mean, I don't mind it in, in black. I love a good Batmobile. I love a DeLorean. I just don't know, in terms of the target market, if it's going to do the numbers that we expect. But it'd be fascinating to see how it plays out. George, um, George, yeah. I apologize. George Janarikas, Canaccord Genuity Managing Director and Yahoo Finance's Pras Subramanian. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Netflix is getting back to basics, focusing more on licensing content rather than creating its own. At the UBS media conference in New York, Netflix CEO Ted Sarandos noting that the licensing availability has opened up, quote, a lot more as traditional media companies focus on profitability. And Netflix is ready to step in. With more on what this means for the streaming space, we're joined by Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal. Hey, Ali. Hi, Rochelle. And yes, licensing is something we didn't see a ton of even five years ago as these streaming services and media companies really worked to make sure they had exclusive content on their platform. But recently, that's certainly changed as debt levels rise, interest rates are high, content spending has ballooned. And across the board, a lot of these media companies are pulling back on some of that content spending. But at the same time, they still want to make sure that they have as much content as possible on their platform so that they can both reduce churn will also make sure they're continuing to add subscribers. And that's where licensing has come in. Netflix has done this very well. If you take a look at some of the shows that they license, Suits, uh, for example, comes to mind. This is something that Ted Sarandos mentioned several times during that conference yesterday. Suits was a USA Network show that went on to Peacock and Amazon before landing on Netflix. And once it did, it absolutely exploded. It was a top show for this platform several months in a row. It generated really strong word of mouth and really showed how powerful licensing can, can be. Sarando said during that conference that licensing to us has the added benefit of enhancing IP plus revenue and we should win the jump balls. In that sense, he's referring to the fact that, you know, because of Netflix's search and discovery, because of the fans and viewers on Netflix, when you license a show, it's likely that that show is going to perform very well. And it's also worth men mentioning that this is not just a Netflix story. Warner Brothers Discovery CEO David Zaslav, same with NBC Universal, they've heavily been licensing and have talked about the benefits of licensing moving forward. So that's something to watch as the streaming wars continue to evolve. But outside of licensing, Netflix said that they are focused on other areas of content creation as well. In particular, Unscripted has done really well for Netflix, like the Beckham documentary. But there are still areas of untapped potential. So Ted Sarando said local language Unscripted is something that the streamer could do more on in addition to animation. He said uh, out of the top 10 movies, most streamed movies, eight of them were animated titles. So that's something that they want to work on as well. So expect some other areas of growth on the content side as, uh, you know, the year moves on and we head into 2024. Okay, Ali Canal staying on the Netflix beat for us today. Thanks so much for that. Well, today marks six months since Linda Yaccarino stepped in as CEO of X, formerly known as Twitter. The NBC Universal alum was brought in with the goal of restoring X's relationship with advertisers, a goal owner Elon Musk has made increasingly difficult to achieve. According to The New York Times, dozens of brands have paused campaigns on X after Musk endorsed anti-Semitic comments earlier this month. The company is estimated to lose as much as 75 million dollars by year end as a result. With more, uh, let's bring in Mark Douglas, CEO of advertising software company Mountain. Um, good to talk to you today. 75 million is where the New York Times puts it. How are you assessing the fallout here for X? Well, I think the way to look at it is that first we're talking about large brand advertisers. They don't <laughs> use X as a primary platform. So they see X as kind of I, you know, quite frankly, the crumbs that are left over after they spend their big TV budget. So that's kind of the first big problem they have. And quite frankly, I mean, in some ways, Elon is right. He shouldn't be dependent on those advertisers. The advertisers that consistently spend big ad dollars spend them on Google and Meta. And X is just those are big um, performance advertisers, direct response advertisers. They just don't see X as a primary platform either. So that, so they have two big problems. The big brand advertisers, they can't count on. And the performance advertisers can't count on X because the platform doesn't have the features that Google and Meta has. So it's a, it's a real issue. So those are the major advertisers that left, what's the reason for them to come back? Um, I don't are think they're going to no, I don't think so. I don't think there's any reason for, you know, kind of like a big CPG brand to be on X in the first place. I think what 
what they're going to have to do is to attract users that performance advertisers want. You can't take a product like X, a social media product, and try to sell it to big, to big advertisers that traditionally use television. It's just fundamental mismatch. And I don't think those advertisers, let, let's put it this way, let me change it slightly. If they were driving measurable revenue from X, they wouldn't cut those budgets. But because they're not, those budgets were easy to cut. And so they're not going to come back to X. And X is going to have to find a new type of advertiser to, to grow their advertising revenue or a whole new revenue source. So if you're a Linda Yaccarino, I mean, after the, the commentary that we heard from Musk, I mean, we know that they, he put her in as CEO. She has all this advertising experience. But at the end of the day, it really starts and ends with Musk here. What sort of a job does she have here with advertisers? Well, I think the first thing is they have to raise user engagement. They have to find users on X that the, the majority of direct response advertisers are interested in. Remember, a big TV network like a Disney has maybe 1,000, 2,000 advertisers. You know, Meta has millions. Google has millions. It's the millions of small advertisers who where the real money is for a social media product like X. And so they have to raise user engagement, you know, have users really using the, the platform and then have an ad product for those smaller advertisers. And then they won't have these kind of boycotts. They won't have these kind of issues, but it's a tall order. It's going to take, you know, even if they were determined to do it, that's a one to two year effort to get done. So it's, it's not an overnight thing. And so, of course, advertisers have their use of, of social media, but also traditional television and, of course, streaming. So as we break that down, we know that Apple and Paramount, Paramount are reportedly eyeing a deal to bundle their streaming platforms, according to The Wall Street Journal. What would this yeah. possible partnership mean as streamers really search for a path to profitability? Well, I think for someone like Apple, they have they need to continue to broaden their audience. Also, they're competing against Netflix, they're competing against Disney+. Plus. You know, the Netflix in particular just has a massive library of content. It's kind of like the first place you go when you want to watch television. And so for Apple to play in that game and continue to expand, they need to expand their library. And they've been doing it by creating original content. But I think it makes a ton of sense for them to start to license and buy content from Paramount, maybe from ABC, maybe from, you know, from any sort, Bravo, any source where users are going to have more and more reasons to, to go to Apple Plus and to, to basically pay those subscription fees. I think you're going to see a lot more of that happening, either outright acquisitions or certainly lots of licensing deals. In some ways, Mark, it's starting to feel like cable again, right? Yeah, back in the it's back to the, yeah. It, <laughs> Seeing it, all those brands coming together. Yeah, it's, it's Mark very Douglas, back to Douglas, Mountain the CEO. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Sure. Well, CVS announcing today it is transforming the way it reimburses pharmacies for prescription medications. We've got our very own Anjali Kamlani with the details there. Um, what, what's exactly the breakdown? Well, Akiko, we know that CVS has been sort of front and center in this discussion around PBMs and around how high <clears throat> cost of drugs are, uh, really with the government putting a focus on it, with the price negotiations you see, as well as that focus on the PBM sort of laws and bills that, that are coming down the pike. And so this is CVS pivoting as a result of that to adopt what is kind of an already known strategy. You know that Mark Cuban's cost plus drugs has sort of set the tone for uh, you know, adding that layer of having the base cost plus fees uh, added on to get to that final price. So CVS pushing for this transparency now and announcing it in their investor day today. And uh, CVS Care Mark uh, President Mark Joyner, uh, sorry, David Joyner, just had sort of the an interesting way of sort of expressing what was going on. And that was really that with the shift in the way that we, the customers, pay for healthcare, that is the shift to high, high deductible insurance plans with more of us burdening, uh, getting that burden of the cost. That has really is sort of been the catalyst for CVS looking at this shift. Now, this all this plans that and all of the news that came out today um, is supposed to start in 2025. Uh, they are going to be uh, sort of releasing the cost vantage. That's the thing I've been talking about in 2025. But they're looking at how coupons, we know these third party coupons like GoodRx and the like, um, will play a role as early as 2024 when they start to roll it out in Q2. Meanwhile, they're also looking at their PBM model, the way that they've had different formularies and the like, 
they're going to have a true cost version also to roll out in 2025 that gives employers and other clients an opportunity to look at how they want to pay for their medicines and how they want the cost to be shifted around. So really just an overhaul in strategy, if you will. And, um, you know, executives today did mention that this is all preparing for the future. We've seen that the, the company has struggled with its a pharmacy revenue over time. And we've seen, of course, what's happened in the pharmacy space, notably Rite Aid uh, closing down. And so we, we've had a lot of pressure on these facilities, on prescription dispensing and the like. And this is sort of where that is playing a role. Certainly continue to watch that. Hopefully some more relief for consumers as well. Appreciate you, Anjali Kemlani. All right, well, let's get your final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Seeing some selling action kicking off after we saw a jump after that, those October monthly jolts data showing that showing that the job openings had cooled faster than expected. As we look there, the Dow currently down about 0.4%, about, about 150 points. S&P 500 there, still relatively flat, but in negative territory there, we're seeing only consumer discretionary, the only one in the green there, although tech not too far behind, which is why we see the tech heavy Nasdaq there, the only one in the green, but ever so barely just up about 10 points on the day so far. Well, that's it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufa with Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching and stay with us on Yahoo Finance.